It's coming, you... Welcome, everybody. We're here all access with the lovely Mickey James and Mickey's best friend, Elvis. Elvis is going to be a big part of today's interview, I think. Hi, Elvis. How are you doing? He's going to steal the show. Right. Should I ask all questions to Elvis first? And Maybe. Run them through him. Well, <laughs> Mickey, I am so excited to have you on today. We Really, I don't think I've ever had a, regr a girl reject me as much as you where I just didn't give up. I've asked you since the day... You were a free agent after leaving WWE for the first time about sitting down and doing one of these all-access interviews with me, and uh, you've turned me down I know. literally hundreds of times. I know. I think I was really apprehensive about doing interviews, especially like with the way that some of them, in watching them, have come off, and just I always was nervous like what kind of light you would be seen in, and, and I've always made it an effort to, to have my career and what I've done it be seen in a positive as much of a positive light as possible um, because I'm really proud of it and um, I was just nervous I guess and a lot of times when people roll off TV they're you know they're angry because they're confused because they don't know you know why they're not there right now right and, and you, you do these interviews and where you're at a different stage of your life so I'm sure if we would have sat down with you four years ago you probably would have had a different perspective than we have like right now oh absolutely absolutely and you know and I didn't want to come off as as bitter or angry because I'm not by any means because I'm truly grateful um, for my path and my career and obviously like there's been some things like even when I left WWE I was very lost and confused I think and and sad and so definitely in a different place now than I was then um, and obviously some magical things have happened since then and, and I think that had that not happened which I, w I didn't see at the moment at that moment but had that not happened I wouldn't have been able to move forward and gain from it like I have well, we're excited because this thing has turned out to be much more than like your standard shoot interview where we just kind of talk and ask you to talk about memories of your career. You're giving us full access to uh, not only your, your wrestling background, but we're going to go behind the scenes and look at some of the music career stuff that you're doing. We're going to go behind the scenes and see how you get ready for a wrestling show. I think we're going to hit uh, a project, some territory that no one's ever never been down so I'm, I'm really excited about uh doing this entire project with you well i'm excited too and this is a new adventure for you and it's a new adventure for me so it should be fun well we're going to start with the old standard questions and uh you know i you, and i'm sure you don't remember this and, and i didn't tell you this before camera but i met you almost 13 years ago right right when i was trying to be an aspiring pro wrestler myself <laughs> and i remember you came down with uh with joey at the time got, uh, joey mercury who you were dating back then and uh you came into the locker room at a really small indie show that you wouldn't have even remembered and i just remembered how impressed i was by um how you conducted yourself you know like uh, the really pretty girl that comes in here and she goes around shaking it shaking everybody's hand I and mean, i could tell that you did all the right things even back then before before you ever had any of the success that you did achieve. Oh, thank you. But uh, going way back, let's let's talk about Mickey James, the uh, the little girl growing up in Virginia. Oh wow. Um, well, uh, as most people know, I grew up on a horse farm. My grandmother um, had forty seven acres, and I that was my whole life. Like I started riding when I was about four years old. It was the first time I got on a horse, and by six years old. I was competing and doing horse shows, and um, I still have my mare. She's she's she'll be 28 in April. Mm -hmm. That my grandmother gave me for my Christmas and birthday present for my 11th birthday, and it was just such a massive like it was it was just a, a big part of my life. And I think that that toughness of like growing up on the farm, having to fall down and get right back on the horse and all that like really molded me as far as being that fighter, mm -hmm. and you know throughout my wrestling career it really kind of it fell over well but um yeah I mean I wasn't typically like I was never one of those like popular girls in school or even you know I was kind of a nerd actually like I the you nerd know that rode the horses huh? the nerd yeah and that was my weekends that was my summers um and I just you know did that and then in high school like late middle school last year middle school and through high school I played the violin for five years and was really working hard at my studies and stuff and um, I was trying to get because obviously I mean I didn't come from a lot of money my family is very like middle-class America and so I was working on trying to get the honors diploma in order to go to school um, and or go to college I guess I would say but um, 
I failed trigonometry my senior year. It's so a tough one. Yeah, I graduated with like 30 some credits, but because I didn't have that last math credit, it totally screwed up my um, honors diploma. Uh, but it was fine because then after that, it's like I kind of got out of high school and I really didn't have a lot of direction and I was working at a bar. And, you know, that was kind of how I ended up falling into the wrestling business, I guess. Were you still after high school, like uh, trying to make some sort of career path out of, of horses? Racing Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's or? what I honestly thought that my life, that's where I thought my life was headed. I thought I was going to be a horse trainer. That's what I, that's the only thing I really knew. That's what I was really great at. Like, I mean, we had trophies and ribbons and I mean, it could fill up a whole wall of like awards that my sister and I won doing, um, you know, competing in horse shows and stuff. So I honestly thought that that's, that's the way my life was, was kind of headed. And you know, the schools that I was looking at at the time were all equestrian related schools um, to kind of further my studies in that. And uh, yeah, it wasn't, it was just, and they, they are still a massive part of my life, my horses. I have three. Um, yeah, because you're like the only, you know, every person who kind of makes it, they move to Florida or they move to LA. I know, I know. You, you've kind of stuck to your roots right there in Virginia. I know. Um, well, I think that it was one of those things of like, I grew up in the country and being on the road especially when I finally made it to the road. Like, I, the only time I really moved away from home out of Virginia was when I moved to Louisville for three years. And the moment that they told me I could move home, I was so excited. I was just like, okay, I can't wait, right? Like, I can go back and be, because I, at that point, I had kind of let my parents take care of my horses for those three years that I lived there. And um, I just kind of missed it. I missed that whole lifestyle and um, not that I wasn't extreme like I had so much fun in Louisville like it was a life-changing experience it really molded me in a lot of ways but I just missed it and I think that once you're on the road and you're in city after city after city it's just nice especially I guess if I you know I don't know everybody kind of grows up differently but I grew up with that like hearing the crickets and the frogs and the birds chirping and for me like that that was my sense of peace and so when I come off the road it's just nice to get back to that to kind of get back to your roots and get back to who you are and it must be a challenge even with your, you know, your wrestling and, and now even with your music career. I mean, you must be tempted to move to Florida or move to Nashville because it's got to be more convenient for your career to oh, be absolutely. in one of those places. And the thing is, is that with Nashville, at least, I feel like there is there is that sense of Nashville is a big city, but it's got that small town feel. And I have considered and, and I'm still considering moving to Nashville because obviously it would aid my music career immensely. Like all my musicians, my band is out of Nashville you know, my team is out of Nashville, the label is in Nashville, everything's there. Um, but obviously the market sucks right now, so I can't seem to sell. I'm going to try oh, to I'm sell right my house. Oh, I'm right there with you. I've, I've got yeah. an old house. So I if anybody wants to buy a house in the middle of nowhere, Virginia, <laughs> you let me know. Um, but yeah, so obviously there is that kind of, I'm, I'm definitely considering like making that that move. And it was kind of a lifestyle move because I have to move everything there, my horses and my family and my life. Or, well, not my, really my family. They're going to stay in Virginia. I don't have kids. I have dogs. Um, they so count as kids. They do count as kids. They do. Well, we were we were talking about this before camera. Like, uh, you know, my dogs are definitely, when they said you have kids, I absolutely, I have two. Right. They just both have four legs. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, as we'll probably see during this interview, you have one of your children with you today. And uh, yes. you said you have another one back home. I do, Butch. He's, um, he's a lab mix. There was a sign on the side of the road. It said free ugly puppies and he was the last one left and I had to take him home. He was awesome. He's the best, like, cause he's got so much personality and he's kind of dopey and like, he's, he's really intelligent. He's just clumsy. So he trips over his own feet and yeah, he's the best, but he actually does tricks. Elvis does no tricks. He just steals the show. He is going to steal it today. <laughs> so it's post high school. You're, you're, you're you're dealing with horses. You're not really sure where your your life is headed. How how do you find pro wrestling? Um, well, I, I mean, I was engaged at the time. Uh, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say that I was in love per se. I feel like I was in love with the with the idea of being in love. And and, and how old were you when you were first engaged? Um, I. Eighteen, going on nineteen. Oh, youngster! I was, and he was—he was, he was, was a he bit a high school sweetheart. Type no, team? not at all. Like I had a high school sweetheart. He was a captain of the wrestling team, and we broke up before I graduated. Um, which was, you know, it was fine. I was heartbroken at the time, right? But um, 
No, this he was a guy that I met actually where I was working at the time, and we kind of it was it's just like you know that crazy like bar scene lifestyle or whatever, and mm -hmm. kind of just fell in lust, I would say, and um, he's a nice guy or whatever, but it's just kind of didn't work out uh, for obvious reasons because we were just at two way different places in our lives, and it just didn't work out. So anyway. Um, I was, uh, you know, but at the, whenever there was wrestling on, like, I was a massive fan. I grew up watching wrestling with my dad. Like, that was our, my, my parents are separated. They got separated when I was really young. And so when I would go see my dad on the weekends or every other weekend or whatever, that was kind of like our thing was wrestling. Like, that was the, that was the thing that kind of bonded us that we both loved. And, like, he introduced me to wrestling. That's how I fell in love with all these, like, larger-than-life characters that you could kind of escape into and pretend to be. Um... What, what kind of wrestling did you and Dad watch? Was he like a, a like an NWA Mid Atlantic fan? Or yeah, was it was more of that because I, I remember, and I I don't you know at that time because it was so like you know I'm six years old, seven years old, eight years old. Like I don't remember all that. I just remember loving Ric Flair, obviously. Um, I always loved the bad guys mm -hmm. for some reason, and we never got WrestleManias or anything like that. Um, we just kind of watched whatever was on television and obviously growing up in Virginia like it was more of that like kind of mid-Atlantic and and I remember loving Ricky the Dragon Steamboat mm -hmm. um and I loved Macho Man so we watched a little bit of both sure. both sides of it but it was um yeah whatever I mean it was awesome did you ever like a go to live events with your dad or was no it just a I bomb? honestly I didn't the first live events that I ever went to was actually once I was in the wrestling business oh, wow. I never got to see wrestling live um, until that. Like, we spent, as far as on my mom's side, we spent all of our money in the horses. Like, that was, you know, horse shows are expensive. It's an expensive industry to be in. It's expensive all the way around. Um, and, yeah, we never, I mean, not even, like, uh, independent shows. I had never even heard of such a thing. And even when I fell into, like, when I, so I was working at the bar, and a friend of mine who was a bouncer at that bar, he goes, you know, there's this, my buddy owns a wrestling school. It's like, you know, Manassas, Virginia, which is like two hours from me. He goes, you love, because once it was on, on Mondays or Thursdays, I mean, you could not pry me away from the TV. I was locked in, right? Like, I was like a little mm -hmm. kid watching cartoons. And um, it was kind of like in that whole Attitude Era as well, like as a massive WWE fan. And so it was... It was that, and then I, I, I was like, I had no idea there was such thing as a wrestling school. Like, I thought, I don't know where I thought that these characters came from. I thought maybe they just found them, or they were born wrestlers. I don't, I didn't really know. And so, it was that day. It was in um, November '98. Uh, I went to my first day of training and went to just kind of check it out. And um, they tried to get me to sign on as a valet and like kind of work that side of it. And I was like, well, no. If I want to do this, I want to, I want to actually wrestle. Like, mm -hmm. I want to be one of the wrestlers and. So it was that day I signed up, and been, it's been a roller coaster ever since. So you signed up, the, you pay whatever the dues are, right? And uh, talk about what type of training they have at this particular school. Oh gosh, it was a whole. It's I mean, I could say, the name of it was Kaida Pro. Um, it was this hole in wall school, and it was in the back of a martial arts center, mm -hmm. and it was a boxing, it was a boxing ring in the middle, in the back of this martial arts center that was literally like probably on these two sides, like two feet away from the wall. You know, so mm -hmm. you're like, but I learned how to run the ropes, I learned how to take my first bumps, I learned how to grab headlocks and start to chain wrestle and just kind of started learning the basics. Um, and I stayed there, uh, you know, cause we did small shows in front of 100 people or whatever at the National Guard armories and stuff. Um, so you're giving up probably a really good payday at the bar where you're making your money to go to these wrestling shows where I'm, there's a hundred people and you're probably making and money. I'm setting up the ring and not right. making any money right so things haven't changed for uh, <laughs> breaking into the business right? right no I mean that was my first especially like my first two probably two and a half years was that was help set up the ring or whatever and it wasn't until um, I had met Joey and I changed schools to Maryland Championship Wrestling where I really started to branch out as a performer and really start to build my name as an as an independent wrestler, um, and not only get better but like build a little bit of credibility and uh, it's where I attended a lot of those you know different camps and stuff like that and really just became more of a because you know those first two years was kind of like just getting the 
not just falling in love with the business and what it entailed, but like seeing, kind of seeing how bad I truly wanted it. And that Marilyn was, you know, three, four, almost four hours from me mm -hmm. to go to that school. And I still went, you know, twice a week. And um, I was really fortunate that Danny McDivitt, like, allowed me to kind of transfer to schools and start going there. And then, because his shows at the time were, and you know, they were pretty, they were really great, actually, because I went from wrestling in front of, you know, 100 people in Stanton, Virginia, to, you know, 1500 people in Jessup or wherever it was Maryland you know that because he just kind of he'd always bring in names and that was where I got to meet sensational Sherry and um, for the first time which was incredible because I idolized her so much you know as a, as a kid and you know really tried to be you know like her in a lot of ways so I think that um, it was a good move for me and and it really kind of helped branch me out and that's how I got more bookings up and down the East Coast and, and really start, that's probably after I met you. And then, um, now how did, we'll, we'll weave in some of the relationships that you've had with some wrestlers here over the course of the interview. But the first one that I want to talk about is Joey. How did you meet Joey? Because I remember it was, it was Joey, Christian and Mickey did a lot of traveling up and down the East Coast. Here. Yeah, we did. And Joey and I were like best friends in a lot of ways, you know, like it was, I met him at a show in, it was in Virginia, and I, I forget who the, the promoter was for, but that was the first time I'd met him, and we, we just kind of had become friends, and then obviously him and, and Christian got picked up, and they were in Memphis at the time, and they moved to Memphis, and he had always said, like, oh, well, if you ever need advice, you ever need help, or whatever, and then, so we stayed friends for a while during that, and it was after he got um, let go from Memphis, you know, from the developmental there, that we kind of really clicked and hit it off and obviously like I had separated from my fiance at that point and we had been broken up for about six months or so and it was more I don't know it's weird because it was we ended up just kind of chatting one day and it ended up next thing you know it's like bright and early in the morning we realized that we've been chatting for hours mm -hmm. right and it just kind of like molded from there and it was one of those I mean we were together for four years maybe even more like it was just kind of it was a cool thing because we both had that same love for wrestling and I learned a lot from him because he's very intelligent mm -hmm. and he loves this business like nobody's business and and to see him to where he's he's gone since then like as being you know the head trainer pretty much or one of the head trainers in, in FCW like I'm just couldn't be more happy for him because he's a good person and he did, absolutely de deserves it you know um, and he has so much to teach, you know, so it's, it's cool. But yeah, it was, it was fun because we had, you know, him, Christian and I, and, and even our buddy Brent, which I'm not sure if you know Brent, but- He was probably there, but I don't remember. Yeah, that. Brent has, you know, he walks with a cane. He was in a bad car accident. Yep. You I know, know Brent? I know exactly what you're talking yes. about. Yes, so he was in a bad car accident when he was younger and he had rods put in his back. And, and I actually met Brent in Maryland and kind of took him underneath my wing and it was like yeah you know, Joey obviously was like what the hell like really like at first but mm -hmm. then he you know he's like fungus he grows on you right. I love him to death I, we're still great friends I talk to him all the time and um, so yeah and it would be the four of us in the car just you know being stupid and traveling the roads making, those probably, making little money right you know those are probably but some hustling of the, the best memories you have you it know, was great going it, town to town not making a lot of money putting way too many miles on that car right Luckily, it was a crap car, so it didn't matter. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, this, it was awesome. It was like, you know, that whole wanting it, like that was when we all really wanted it, you know, and, and not that we don't still want it, but it was like that hungry passion of just trying to make it and hustling. The struggle of actually making it, some of the, yeah. I guess the, the most interesting part of most of these wrestling careers. I mean, because once, you, once you've been spoiled, right. you know, it's never the same. It's that is true because it's like you, you don't mind the hustle like but it's like you feel you're like you're digressing almost because you have to go back to that hustle and bustle because you've you've already achieved that goal and you've made it to where you want to go and so it's like well do I really want to go back to travel in the roads and you know driving six hours for you know if you if you if I was to tell you hey there's you know a thousand bucks hanging from a tree in Nashville would you drive there and get it we'd be there in eight hours <laughs> right right so it's like you know um 
But back then it was like, hey, there's a hundred bucks hanging from a tree in Jersey. You want to go get it? And mm -hmm. we're like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> right. You know, so I don't know. And uh, how supportive was your family of uh, your decision to be become a pro wrestler? Extremely supportive in the sense of my mom's always been like she was obviously very nervous of the hazards of of, of wrestling, you know. But then she's seen me fall off of horses constantly, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I guess that was different. I don't know. I don't know. But it, you know, plus being on the road and driving late and being in different towns and. That whole side of it, I think, was what made her more nervous than just the in-ring stuff. Because once she came to a few shows and she realized that, okay, we're legitimate professional. Like, we're trained. Like, I wouldn't consider myself a professional at that point. Like, yes, I was training and I was trying to do it, but I, I wasn't, I hadn't made it to a point where I was actually making a living off of it, right? Like, so, um, but she realized how much I loved it and that I was getting better every time, you know, um, and that I really wanted to do this. And my dad, being that he was such a massive wrestling fan, was all about it. Like, he was, oh, it was totally cool. And there had come a point, like, right before I got signed with um, WWE, and where it was that whole, like, hey, you know, you've been doing this for, I know you love it, but you've been doing it for about, you know, five, six years now, and nothing's really come of it. So you might want to start considering, like, what else you might want to do in life, you know, just in case, like backup plan kind mm -hmm. of deal. And I'm like, what? That's not even an option. Like, I'm going to do this. Like, this is what I'm going to make it. Why? You know, and I'm, you know, they were, of course, like, if I believed in it, then they believed in me, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was, I was fortunate in that. Because I know there's a lot of people that struggle with that where they're like, oh, absolutely not. You can't. That's not something you can do. Yeah, I know how supportive they are because I've seen, I've, I've been around your career quite a bit where I've seen you on shows where, uh, you, mom or dad has shown up and, and still been supportive. Even yeah, the fact. yeah. They're so still, they still come out and see you and uh, yeah, close which is pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome, and it's cool, especially like to like they've been to the big shows, they've been to the WWE shows, and you know they've been to the WrestleManias, and even like now, like to come back and do some of the indie shows and where they're sitting or whatever and kind of hanging out and seeing the whole thing from behind the scenes. I think it opened their eyes to, in fact, like how hard it was. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Um, not just coming up or even after the fact, you know, like it's not an easy life, you know, it's not for everybody. That's for sure. Going back to the struggle, the time when you didn't have a contract and you're chasing the hundred dollar bills, you know, <laughs> eight hours away. Uh, what was your goal I and mean, what was the plan? I mean, who were, who were the, I, I guess the, the ultimate goal would have been to work for WWE, but at that time WCW existed. Yeah. ECW existed. Memphis was still an active territory. Well, what was Mickey James trying to do at that time? I wanted to make it to WWE. I wanted to be a superstar. Like, I didn't get in and into the business just to say I wanted to be a wrestler. Like, I loved it, and, I, you know, I was chasing those $100 bills and, and doing all everything that I had to do and doing these camps and training, you know, with the Ricky Steamboat camp and the Ricky Morton Bobby Eaton camp and anything that I could get a hold of that would help me and aid me and, and you know, make me learn a little bit more. Um, and, and not to interrupt you, but I remember one of those camps that you did that really upped your profile was working with Dory, Dory Funk. Yeah. I remember, uh, you know, at that time he was, you know, one of the most high, high profile trainers in camps. There were a lot of WWE guys that went through there on the right. way up to the top. Uh, what are your memories of that, that camp? Dory's amazing. There's me, like, okay, so, I didn't actually go to Florida to try, and I, and I know like Edge and Christian and Lita, and, and I think the Hardy Boys went through there, and it was a cool thing for us, but what we did is at the school, this was at Kaida Pro, the, the mm -hmm. first school I went to, is that we all paid our dues to do this camp, and we brought Dory in for a week-long seminar kind of deal, so he was there for a right. full week, and we got to train with him. And the cool thing that I thought was, even, I mean, I've even seen it now because I've, I've gone down and worked with the Funks and done some of his bank TV. And, and um, I think the great is that he still just gets in there and goes, mm -hmm. you know, and his mannerisms and the way he kind of explains, because he's such a shot, like you don't think about this because he's such a, a, he's a big man, you know, and he's very impressive, but he's very reserved and very shy, you know. It's because he's got that better half that's the personality there. with, with Is that what, yeah, yeah. And she's the one that's going to tell it like it is, right? Absolutely. <laughs> 
So, and we all need that, I guess. It's that ba that balance, right? Mm -hmm. But, I, I mean, I learned a lot from that. And it was cool to be able to get in and, like, see him, if, see him go in and go through the motions and kind of show you just, like, little things of, like, body positioning and ring positioning and stuff that, at that point, at a year in, year and a half in, I had no clue. Like, I knew how to fall down. I knew how to grab a headlock and do some cool moves, what I thought were cool. Um, but I had no idea why I was doing any of it. You know, so I think it just kind of, and then to be able to go back, and then about a year later, I went back to Florida and worked one of his shows and stayed around for a few days and ended, you know, with a camp that he had kind of going on at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it's cool because, and then I've been able to also go, since I've been able to go back so many times, I've been able to see some of the talent that he's, you sure. know, kind of helped mold through and bring through. So. Hey, almost, I love Dory. Almost everybody have, on their way up finds Dory Funk at some point. Yeah, um, and I think that everybody falls in love with them. Because yeah. how can you not, right? One of the other things that you did before you got signed was uh, I think you had an ECW tryout. I did. T tell us of your memories. I, I, I know you said that there's going to be some times today that you don't remember all the details. but uh, I know. I think that I've forgotten more than I remember in my life. Um, but I do remember this ECW tryout. Um, I... I was, I went up and I, you know, obviously, I think the idea was eventually, from what Tommy Dreamer has told me, was to bring me in as Beulah's little sister. And obviously ECW was kind of almost going out at that point. So um, I don't know exactly, I know I went in and I took about 200 DDTs from Mikey Whipwreck. That's what I remember. And I had a sore head the next day. <laughs> Because I probably took about 50 of them correctly. No, I probably took about at least half of them correctly. Um, and they seemed to love me, and it was great, but it was just one of those things of, like, the timing. And I don't know if it was a matter that they couldn't pay me or where it was. Because it wasn't long after that that DC ECW went out of business. Um, but it was really, really cool. And that's where I really kind of met Tommy, and I think that's where Tommy and I had that connection in the sense of like I gained a lot of his respect as well um but yeah I was green and I you know it wasn't I was I was better than some a lot of the girls right. on the independence at that at that time but saying that it, it wasn't saying much you know what I mean like but I think that's that was it was a cool experience and it was cool to be able to do that and I feel like if had that happened and come to fruition and, and I wonder how my career would have went differently mm -hmm. Because, you know, you just, you just never really know. What were some of the, uh, I guess, the regular uh, promotions you were working for at that time? Um, I was Obviously, Maryland Championship Wrestling. I was Wrestling. obviously working with Maryland Championship Wrestling. Um, and there was a few promotions in Jersey and New York that I would, that I would work for. And it's hard to remember them all because... Didn't you, weren't you a regular in the all girls, like, w, like WW or whatever they called themselves? WEW, yeah. women's, Yes. It was horrible. How, I was going to say, how does, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say it's like a, you know, a it was people... one of those things that was like, I, um, myself and the other girls I was working with in Maryland mm -hmm. were regulars on that. And they went through Dan McDivitt and who was also running his own, which was a little bit more tasteful. I think the BBOW, beautiful babes of wrestling. Um, he did a few shows or tried to did that, but I was, you know, we were like some of the only wrestlers on that show like it was very rare and so I have to qualify because a lot of people think an all women's promotion they think of like shimmer and shine and where w they're very like they are wrapped around right. the wrestling aspect of it yes the WW not so much not so much not so much and I remember that half these shows was like they were at bars you know so it was obviously you know a bunch of drunk guys or whatever all like here to watch a bunch of women's wrestling and they would open the show with you know these girls who were doing oil wrestling or mud wrestling or and it was frustrating because then people would go like obviously you get that like oh I'm a professional oh what do you mean like mud wrestling like uh, no I'm professional wrestling like a mm -hmm. wrestle like a legit wrestle and so it's like but I was you know the thing is, is that he always took because I think I was you know I was the an actual wrestler from the promoter from from Dan Coal mm -hmm. uh, I always had a lot of respect for you know, from him, like I'd always get paid is because he knew that the shows would run super late at some point. So he'd always give me my money up front and take excellent care of me. And, you know, I made decent money doing those shows and I would always have legit wrestling matches. Like, 
had How my first. How long is it on a show? Like, hey, I got GI Ho in this match, <laughs> yeah. and an oil wrestling match, and then Ty Killer Weed right? over here, who was Mickey, hilarious. <laughs> and Alexis Lurie has to follow that in a right, and you're going. Match. Yeah, and it's like, do these people actually want to see, at this point, do they even want to see a real wrestling match mm -hmm. in this little 16 by 16 Barbie doll ring, you know? But, but it but was it, fun. Everything's it was fun. a learning experience. What, what it was. would you say in general you learned from those all-girls shows? Um, I Well, character stuff. Like, really just kind of, A, trying to, like, the one thing is it's like to sell people on something that they weren't expecting. Because after you've seen all that stuff and then to go out and try to get people into a legit wrestling match was always a tough feat especially if there was baby oil in the middle of the ring still you know so there's slick spots there's certain there's low ceilings like having to adapt your matches and your style or whatever to where you're at you know and because of sometimes the people that you may have been working with at the time the different skill levels that they were at and having to try to build that you know around that as well as a lot of things on the fly, you know? Because if something's not working because these guys are drunk and they're chanting puppies because it's fun at that time, you know, right. it's like, okay, well, where do we go from here? Yeah, there's so many obstacles. It was just, at, at some point you just have to go like, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Like, we're just gonna go out there and we're gonna have fun and have a 10 minute match and do, do what seems to work. You know, you started your I guess your national TV career with with the I guess the beginning of TNA, but you were you were on the second ever TNA pay per view, I believe. Yes. And it was well. It was was it the first ever or second ever? Because we did that taping, and it was for the, you know, whoever won this battle royal got the contract to be a TNA. At that just point, you know, it wasn't a mm -hmm. knockout. It was just to be a uh, you know to get a contract with TNA. Um, so I remember they were having a problem sourcing enough girls to even put this match together with the way I guess they envisioned it. Like, yeah. Do, do you remember like who called you, how how far ahead of time you knew? Um, I, a couple weeks and I feel like it was just one of those things that I kind of, and I don't remember exactly who called me. Um, and I know that Joey and Christian were working those shows as well and so, if, you know, because we were all, like most people knew that we all traveled together or whatever, like we all just, you know, they knew that, well, we got these guys booked, we can use her as an extra girl, mm -hmm. you know, and so I was glad to do it. You know, it gave me some national TV exposure. I really wasn't, at that point, I had, hadn't done Ring of Honor or anything like that yet. Um, and I think it started to, that's one of those things that kind of helped start it getting that ball rolling as far as getting people's awareness of who I was, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it was fun, and that was a schmoz fest and was hilarious, so. Did you have any uh, idea at the time that, like, you may be brought back? I guess you were brought back about six months later uh, for a more regular spot, but, but was there it was that it... early? I felt like it was more like a year. Could have been six months. Sometimes things seem longer than what My they research were. said 34 weeks, but I could... 34 know. weeks. That's just random. <laughs> um, I'm glad you did your homework. Uh, no, it. I didn't... You know, I guess I thought I did. Like, it was weird because... I thought, yeah, you know, well, maybe I'll really win them over and they'll love me and they'll bring me back. And I didn't hear back from them. And that's kind of out of that is when I started working for Ring of Honor and really doing some really cool stuff with them. And uh, I felt like that was actually what kind of started. Like that, that little stint, that little one thing, one off at, at TNA kind of built a little awareness like, hey, there's this girl out there and she can kind of wrestle, you know. Um, and then it wasn't until I worked with Ring of Honor that people could actually start seeing my ability. And I got to work with some really cool people. I got to work with Sumi and do some cool angles. And it was fun. And that was a fun locker room, you know, at that time. It was, uh, you know, ECW at that point was more of a kind of re trying to replace what they lost with, I'm sorry, Ring of Honor replaced ECW in that market. Right. That's kind of what they came in there to do. Um, as, as an independent wrestler, I mean, was, was Ring of Honor one of those things, like, I, that's one place I want to work? I mean, was that a... I think for everybody at that point, because it was such a high profile and they were bringing in, not just trying to bring in the best talent from across, you know, the states, they were also trying to bring in the best talent from overseas as well. Um, and the style of matches, and it was just something different. And I felt like it was more high profile and it was somewhere where that people were actually taking a look at, you know and 
so I was hopeful in the sense that because of that, it would bring more awareness to who I am and I could have better matches in hopes to send to the Fed or whoever to for a tryout tape or, or to, in hopes to get a tryout later. Um, so it was, you know, it was a cool, especially in the beginning because it was so fresh and it was so different mm -hmm. and it, they still tried to involve some cool storylines into it and not just make it these like crazy, you know, 30 minute wrestling matches, but it was, it was fun to be a part of too, because you're in the, you know, helping this baby company grow into this, whatever it, you know, it's going to hopefully become. And I think that it's the fact that it stayed around for so long and now that it's got national, you know, TV exposure and it's still doing some great stuff and they still have some, <laughs> and they Elvis, stop it. Elvis is attacking a cameraman. <laughs> He's I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it's a pretty cool thing. I kind of lost my train of thought there. I was distracted. That's okay. The um... Elvis, stop it. Come. There's Elvis. Stop Could it. you sense at that time that Ring of Honor had something special going for it? Um, I could. I, you know, because it was something. It was so unique and so so different. And I felt like the fans in that area, especially because I don't. I don't want to say the word jaded, but they're so. They've seen so much you know, that they were just begging with ECW gone, that they were just begging for something that was unique to them and that was different enough to, you know, still capture their attention and offer something different than what they were going to see with WWE because they were going to see that and they love that anyway, but they, they still like that different aspect of it, you know, of wrestling. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the debut that you made with Ring of Honor, that was, you, you came in and traveled with York and, uh, and Joey. Mm -hmm. right? Do you remember the, the first the first thing you did for Ring of Honor? Didn't I manage them? I managed them, I feel like, and I managed them in a tag match against, was it AJ and, no. You were halfway there. I was gonna see how far back I could go on your memory. Okay, <laughs> I know I managed them, and I'm trying to think of the tag match it was. Prince Nana and Jacob's Ladder. Oh yeah. God no. <laughs> um, that was purely a test. If you knew that, test. I knew you were going to know every detail of your career in Ring of Honor. So right. No. Uh, more generally, let's talk about the locker room. There was so so much great talent at that time. You know, there was Low Key, Brian Danielson, the Briscoes, Samoa Joe's, Daniels, AJ Styles, Paul London. I mean, it was really a, a who's who of unsigned talent at that time. It really was. It really was. And there wasn't a match that would go out there that you weren't just impressed with. You know, because everyone, and even to see where all of those people, in reality, from for the most part, have gone in their careers since that. Like, for the most part, I would say at least, you know, 60% of them, 70 maybe, have all gone elsewhere and, and you know, have, have taken it to a whole def another level, you know. But you could see it back then that they were that they were going somewhere, you know, it's, it's just, they really were really smart in, in who they pulled in for their, for their talent. And I was, that I think it felt like that's why I was so honored to be a part of it at that time, because there wasn't a whole lot of females, mm -hmm. you know, there was, there was me, there was Becky Bayless, there was Allison Danger, and I'm trying to think of what other females were there. What a lot. Ring of Honor kind no. of geared themselves towards, you know, got, you know, men's wrestling and the performance in the ring. So, you know, I, you know, there's not a lot of girls that could probably be successful with that type of discriminating eye. Right, and to be seen at that same level as these guys were wrestling. I mean, they were having some freaking amazing matches and to say, well, they didn't want to just put out some girls match that they knew was going to be at a total different level, you know. And Alice in Danger was probably one of the top independent girls at that time. Do you, some memories of just working with Alice in, in Ring of Honor. Oh, she's a sweetheart. Yeah, I mean, we we did a you know some cool fun stuff, and she you know she was doing that whole like, um, was she doing that thing with like the special K mm -hmm. and all that like so we got to do some different stuff with that whole deal. Like, thing is, is we we really didn't have I didn't have a ton of wrestling per se matches. It was more of like management and then doing like the girly stuff, um, cat fighting, et cetera. Uh, of it. So I think that that's what it really kind of entailed and offered that different spice of it. And it wasn't really until I actually had a one on one with um, Sumi Sakai there that I feel like people didn't really see my legit wrestling side of it. But that was one of my few legit matches, matches there. Like I had some matches, but they weren't 
you know, there was always some type of schmas involved right. or something that was going to, like, kind of offset it. I mean, you kind of know what you're getting into before, but it, in some ways you probably, it's okay being a valet, but you still want to perform in the ring, right? You know, Absolutely. The goal is still to be in the ring. But especially since at that point, like, I feel like I obviously had some training as a valet, and it's good to have that knowledge because it's a very vital asset, I think. You should be able to be as well-rounded, especially as a female, to be as well-rounded as you can be. Um, and you always have fun with that side of it because you can do more character stuff and, and stuff on the outside. And um, But at the end of the day, like, I love wrestling and I wanted to be a wrestler. So to be able to go in there and try to perform and, you know, perform and, and wrestle, that's what I love to do more than anything. And uh, a lot of people remember you for managing AJ and Red as they won their first tag team titles in Ring of Honor. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. AJ, you know, it's, he's one of those talents, like, He's just, I mean, like his gimmick, phenomenal one. Like it's, it's legit. Like he's so athletic and just naturally charismatic and that whole, you know, and he's just, some of the stuff he, he just does out of, you know, it's just, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. He's incredible. And Red is hilarious. He's so like shy and just kind of, but he's explosive and like to see him there. And I still chit chat with him. He's on my boxer um, now and then, uh, but yeah, I mean, we were all babies then, you know? You know, another guy, and, and, and in some ways his career kind of parallels yours in terms of, you know, his struggle coincided with your struggle as CM Punk. You probably crossed paths with CM Punk at first in Ring of Honor. Mm -hmm. and then you, probably, you did some work with him in TNA, and then you guys started relatively around the same time in WWE. But what are your early memories of CM Punk with his Ring of Honor career? Well, um, I remember him. That's actually how... I got uh, introduced to really coming back to TNA was his feud with Raven mm -hmm. in um, Ring of Honor. And, you know, Punk is a character. He's he's awesome. You know, I, I love him to death. Like, I, he just loves this business so much, but he, like, just demands respect and demands a lot of things. So, I mean, he's super cool, and, he you know, Punk and I have always gotten along great. You know, and so, and I have massive respect for him in the sense of like, I know how hard he's worked and you're right. Like it's, it's kind of like those parallels in the sense of like, we've been to a lot of the same places and on that same kind of roller coaster ride and to see him excel and become what he is today, you know, as far as one of, I mean, he's pretty much one of the top guys in, in the industry, mm -hmm. um, which I know from a lot of people's perspective, they just never really saw that. But if they knew the type of person he was and how hungry he was and how much, like, A, he sacrificed and how much he loved it or whatever, then you could totally see that. Like, he's not that conventional champion by any means, but he's everything a champion should be, you know? Um, so I got mad respect for him. And, and it was cool, like, because, it, because he worked with Raven, that's where Raven came in and that's where he saw me. And then he asked me if, like, oh, you know, I have this idea and I want to do this. So it was actually of, Punk that got your spot back in TNA? Pretty much. Pretty much in a sense because he was doing that big angle with Raven mm -hmm. at the time where they were doing those gory matches that I have a hard time watching those. Like the, I have to watch them through my fingers with the blood and the... Mm. Anyway, so it's because they were doing that and they were in that heated angle with Ring of Honor and Raven came around a few times and he had seen some of my work and seen some of the matches and I guess, you know... That's where he came up with. I guess he had already had the idea to do like a gathering sort of deal, mm -hmm. and he asked me, and I was like, "Well, of course." Like, obviously, I did this, you know, a couple months ago, six months ago, or whatever, with them. But um, he's like, "I was like, I don't know if they're interested or whatever." And he goes, "Oh, I'll talk to him," you know. And that's kind of how I got my, you know, got back in, you know. And so I feel like if it hadn't been for Punk and hadn't been for Raven, you know, working with Punk, Raven would have never met me. I would have probably never met, you know, went back into TNA. And then ironically enough, that's where, you know, they brought in Julio and then brought in Punk. Mm -hmm. And it was weird because Punk and I kind of crossed paths in that, but not to, because it was at that time, it was, you know, they were only doing month to month contracts, maybe three month max contracts. And it was right before they started really signing people to bigger deals. Um, so Punk and I probably only really worked together for about two months there, you know, before I left and I actually got signed with WWE. Yeah, before you got signed with WWE, you did several weeks of TV on TNA. What, what were your memories of some of the different things that you did at that time? 
Bet what's, besides what's the White Trash Cafe. Okay, besides that. <laughs> Get your little tickets and go down and have, have your catering. Um, well, it was... It was cool because I was, you know, it was it was still such a fresh company, and and that was really where I first met with, Je you know, met and really talked to Jeff Jarrett and seen his like hunger and his how how he was like. I mean, he pretty much put everything on the line to to build this company, you know, and it was it was a lot, and that was where I met Jerry as well, and mm -hmm. and um, in fact, as I was leaving. That's when I first met Dixie because she had just bought into the company and became, mm -hmm. you know, when I when I was leaving the first time. So, um, I think it, for me it was just one of those things. The same with like Ring of Honor at the, at the beginning stages. It was like watching this, you know, company really like kind of step up and and try to do something different and special. And you know, when you when you see somebody who's like a pretty much putting it all in the line in hopes that this thing takes off, it, it's it's a pretty amazing site you know and I was it was cool to be able to work with Raven and to do some like I was the for the longest time I was the only female to ever do the clockwork orange house of fun match until Daphne did it before she left you mm -hmm. know and I mean I just got I, I mean I got to work with some high profile people like and I mean I got to work with Jeff Jarrett you know he hit me in the head with a chair <laughs> which at that time like you know at that point you're like I bit marked out for a little sure. bit, you know, because I'm going, Double J, this is awesome. Like, you know, I'm, I'm working with people who are already considered stars. And it's like, not only, you don't really think about the fact like, oh, it's elevating you. You're thinking about the fact of like, this is a cool thing. And, and you don't realize like how that's going to like really mold your career after. Do you think that time that you had on TNA television uh, was ultimately the reason WWE took a really good look at you and signed you a few months later? Oh, absolutely. And and what a lot of people don't know is that I probably had 10 tryouts with WWE, maybe even more. Like, I remember driving to Florida from Virginia. It was like, you know, 15 hours or so for yeah, a tryout. about that process, because that process has really changed now. You you don't just, as an indie worker, don't just get a tryout for WWE anymore. No, I guess not. I don't, and I don't even know how that process works now. But I tell you what I did do is every two weeks I would call Dr. Tom, who was a head, head of you know, that side of the, the talent relations part. And, I mean, I would nag him. I don't know if he just finally, like, because I would get tryouts, and whenever I was in between, prior to getting signed with TNA, um, whenever they were close or whenever it was within driving distance, and I said, hey, I can go, and I'll be an extra, or I'll just go for a tryout. You don't even have to pay me. Like, I'll just, just so I can, they can get a look at me. Mm -hmm. or And I would send them tapes and ask him for his advice and he was super cool and he's still super cool to this day like I'm, I mean I'm sure I nagged the shit out of him and but I, I'm really grateful that he actually took the time to like look at at least half the tapes or maybe at least three of them <laughs> um, but and he's the one who like would call and say tell me when they could use me or when they couldn't use me or even if it was like you know I'm like oh, I'm gonna be you know in this area of, you know that weekend, I can stick around, just stay for whatever. Truthfully, you drive anywhere if they give you a look. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's, you know, I wanted it. Like, mm -hmm. I really just wanted it. And then, as I was with TNA, it was whenever I was in between contracts. Mm -hmm. And I actually did a tryout match um, at SmackDown against Don Marie. Um, this is prior. This is probably the match that I actually got signed off of indirectly. And it was in between contracts with TNA. And I did a match with Don Marie. And obviously, she won. Um, it was a dark match for SmackDown. And Vince Russo was livid. Absolutely livid. Why? Huh? Because, I, I mean, I put over, like, they're building me as this talent, and, like, and I'm taking chair shots and being this mm -hmm. ruthless, like, gothic, crazy chick on their television. And then, But I'm like, it's a dark match, and it's, you know, only the people in that town really saw it. And TNA hadn't given you any type of no, it wasn't contractual commitment. At right, time. right, and it wasn't. You know, it was. It was kind of like a, my contract with WWE kind of kind of came at a crossroads because I was getting ready to get offered a yearly contract with TNA, and I was also offered a three month deal in Japan for like this all girls promotion. But okay. I would have had to stay in the dojo and do the whole. Did and you stay ever there. been to Japan? Or? Never been. So they have you a contract without you ever making your first tour. Yeah. Oh. It was pretty amazing. I mean, I wanted to, like, it was more of those, one of those things of, I think because of the Ring of Honor stint and the stuff with TNA is what kind of what made them give, give a hard look. And it was more of, like, this offer that was on the table, like, hey, we, we want you to come over. And I would have went over on July and been done in September. Um, came back home around September. 
And so I was kind of, you know, I was just really, really torn. And I called Dr. Tom and I talked to him about it. I said, like, I have an offer on the table from TNA to do it. Like, they're getting ready to offer me a yearly contract. My contract for this thing is up X day. I think it was the end of July. Um, and I just don't know what to do. Like, something in my gut told me, don't go to Japan. Just don't do it. And ironically, I mean, I didn't because I figured, well, I'm already on TV here with TNA. Like, obviously, like that, you know, I could still do one more month or whatever with them and just kind of see where the ball lies then. And in August, it was like August 20, 25th or something, that's when Johnny Ace called me and offered me a contract. And it was like, you know, it was like, so where were you? Because everybody remembers this. Um, I was, you know, I was at home and it was with with Joey and we were at home and just kind of hanging out I think we're getting right head to the gym or whatever and I just saw the 203 number and everybody knows the 203 number you're like oh no oh no <laughs> so yeah um and I answered and it was Johnny and I was like oh yeah I was star and I think the original offer it wasn't it was weird it was like the original offer was lower and then he called me back and he goes I'll tell you what I'll tell you what kid we'll give you this but you have to move to Louisville you can finish out these dates up until this day and then you know but you can't work for TNA obviously or whatever and then you know we want you to move to Louisville and he goes oh you'll be there like six months you know and then we'll you know see about bringing you to TV and all this other stuff and I'm going okay this is great this is awesome I love it you know of course uh, you know and uh yeah up and moved to Louisville so you didn't work another TNA date after that no no where uh, where were you with that I mean I guess you were done with the last storyline but did you have to make a phone call to TNA and say hey I I can't, you can't use me anymore. Right, yeah, and it was one of those things, and it, it was obviously, you know, I think Russo was kind of upset with it, you know, with, with, with the whole idea, but actually, you know, who was the coolest about it was Jeff Jarrett, because mm -hmm. he goes, you know what, I get it. He goes, I wouldn't be who I am, and I wouldn't have been able to do the things I've done without the big dance, and so I totally get it. That's where he goes, you would be stupid not to take it, and anybody who says any different is just lying to themselves so go for it and he goes and I wish you the best and if, if it doesn't work out or if anything ever happens the door is always open you know this is a crazy business and, and especially as a girl because a lot of people have their own self-interest you know and, and, and not to say anything bad about Russo but you know Russo obviously looking at you as an asset for him as a writer right and he's not going to tell what's best for you is not going to be best for him in this situation. no he was thinking about and I get it like he's thinking about what's best for the company and what's best for his storylines and what he had in his projection for the next X amount of months or whatever, you know. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to make those decisions of what's going to be best for your career, mm -hmm. you know. So what was the original offer? I mean, I mean, obviously you don't have to talk about the, the numbers, but, I mean, how long was the guarantee with the first offer from WWE? Uh, it was a, um, I mean, it was just a developmental contract. Which, at, for people who don't understand what developmental contract is, for a commitment level there's no well there's no guarantee uh that they're like in that contract there's no guarantee that they're ever going to bring you to tv there's no guarantee that you know you'll ever make it out of developmental but but how long does it guarantee that mickey james doesn't have to worry about how the rent's paid um well technically it guarantees for three years right but that's still no guarantee because you know obviously they could they could keep you under contract for three months and decide that they have no use for you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but fortunately for me, I was, you know, in Louisville probably technically two and a half years training and, you know, it, it was crazy. It was, it was one of those things. It was like, I, cause I guess I went in with the perception of like believing when he said, Oh, it'll be like six months, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going, oh, mom, it's only going to be six months and I'll, you know, I'll be home and, this is going to be awesome, and this is such an amazing opportunity, and, and you know, plus I'd never moved away from home, you know, so it was, so the, first it was the first time I'd legit, like, moved, moved out of this, like, I'd moved away out of home. I hadn't mm -hmm. lived at home since I was 18 years old, but I'd always been close enough to hop in the car and drive 30 minutes or drive an hour and be home. Right. Um, but this was 13 hours away, you know, mm -hmm. which I know, I know we've driven more than that, like, going to a show but at the same time it was just like it was a big deal you can't pop home for Sunday dinner with the, with right. the parents just anytime you want right to. right so um so but with the with the developmental deal is pretty much like we trained 
five, six days a week. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to be there at, you know, eight, nine in the morning until at that time, our training, depending on how, what the trainer was at the time, how they felt, it would be from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon with a lunch break, mm -hmm. you know, and we were going the whole time. I was in the best shape of my life. It was incredible. And I honestly, like, I really, I went from learning, I went from just being a wrestler to really molding myself as my character and how, and, and how to work and how to, like, legitimately go in there and not have to worry about, oh, crap, what am I doing next, and just do it. Like, it became a natural. It just became natural. You know, we'll probably talk about more of this subject towards the end, but it's, it's interesting, the process. You know, it's, it hasn't changed a lot between Ohio Valley and now with the new developmental center that WWE has. Um, you know, they still have, like, 9 to 5 training or 9 to 3 training. But I think you probably get a lot more out of that when you have the background that you did coming up on the Indies as opposed to somebody who started there. Right, I mean, you must have that experience and be able to perform in front of a live crowd. When you when you when you hear it from these trainers, it doesn't it mean more when you have that background from the live. I feel like, and maybe I'm biased because I did come up, and I feel like I came up the hard way. And a lot of the girls that were in that era with me, and even prior to me, came up that same way, with the exception of that whole diva search kind of mm -hmm. niche, which was right in the middle of it all. Um, that I'm grateful that I came in the way that I did because I feel like it not only strengthened me as a performer, but it tested me as to how bad I, I really truly wanted it and it made me that much more of a fighter. And by the time I made it to TV, and this was a, an expression that Rip Rogers, who was one of the head trainers there and who honestly taught me, I know it's, he has this unconventional way and not a lot of, a lot of people agreed with him, but I, I tell you what, I learned so much from him. Um, he always would say, by the time you get, he goes, don't worry about it. Like, keep on working and keep doing what you're doing because by the time you get there, you're going to be overprepared. And honestly, I, I felt like I was. Like, I, I felt like I could go out there and be Mickey James, the character, in the drop of a hat at any point, at any time. You know what I mean? And I was never worried about, a, you know, if something happened or if somebody got hurt. Like, what, and all the what ifs. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't worried about that stuff anymore. And that was stuff that would freak me out prior to going there. It really fine-tuned me and molded me as a performer and then also because of the life experiences and having to move away from home and having to do the struggle pretty much on your own, you know, um, and going through the highs and lows and then worrying about the what if I don't make it, you know, mm -hmm. what if, what if, because you see so many people come and go through that whole developmental system that some people that never even made it to TV and they were extremely talented you know and, and you're just like so there was that point where you go like well what's gonna happen if if after all this after I, I mean I, and I don't make it you know and it, I would never really had that doubt prior to going there but it really tests you it's it really tests you because you probably see so many people that just you know you thought that they had a career and it might be oh this is a person they're gonna call up on TV next week and then all of a sudden they're gone and they're gone and you go like I really thought that person was a star like it's just like, it's crazy. And then you see them come back, and you see them come back and, and be this massive star. Perfect example, Aaron Stevens, mm -hmm. which is Damien Sandow. Like, I saw him come, and he was extreme, he's so talented, and he's a, an amazing worker. And then I saw him get let go, and then come back, and then, you know, you see him come back, and then get let go again. And then now he's come back, and he's turned, you know, Damien Sandow, who is incredible, and he's finally had that chance to really shine as a performer and as an entertainer and as a wrestler. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, everybody's got their own paths, I suppose. Who were the, you mentioned Riff Rogers, but who were some of the other trainers at that time? Oh, gosh. Um, aside from the talent that they brought in, uh, you know, they brought in the Dudley Boys. Edge came down for a stint. Um, obviously, Danny Davis, who, who owns w, uh, OVW, and Jim Cornette were massively involved in, in helping in the training and where they really aided us is they would sit down with the television and with the tapes or whatever and kind of nitpick them apart um, for us which was really really cool because I felt like that's where you know you you beg for that when you go back and watch some of your matches and stuff and I've done it even like you know with the indies and stuff and you go back and watch it and you're like oh my god that was awful um, 
but you want to hear all the things that you did wrong. Like most, you know, things where I was like, I don't, I never really wanted to hear what I did right. Like in a sense, like if you did it right, like it's, you can feel it and you know it. Mm -hmm. But if there was something that you did wrong, but you don't know why, like that's why, what I really wanted to know, because that's what you get better off of. Um, and Lance Storm came in for a bit, which was, you know, for the most part on the tail end of it. And he kind of fine tuned us, or at least for me, to the television style of wrestling and what they needed because you know we're in in OBW you know you could go aside from on television but house shows or spot shows and stuff same as same as live events um you know you could go 10 minutes or whatever no problem and do gaga or whatever else you wanted to do and just entertain you know um but he really kind of helped you into what exactly you needed to do and needed to be for TV um and that's type of training you can't get working the indies no you can't because that's the stuff that you really don't know you have no clue like and it's weird because you could watch it you'd watch it on television and see but you don't understand like why are, like all this stuff is happening and it's only in five minutes I don't understand like you know and you don't understand that that's that's the allotted time for that that particular segment or whatever so it wasn't it's not that you don't you start to learn that aspect of it obviously because there is television there but um, it really helped you understand it, you know, in that aspect. And Al Snow came in for a stint, and he really worked with us on character development because mm -hmm. um, he was always big on character and, you know, obviously wrestling larger-than-life characters. Mm -hmm. um, and Bill DeMott was in there for a bit. And um, so... All right, I'm going to pause right there because are you, are you a Bill DeMott fan? Or? I love Bill DeMott. I love... Probably at that time... It goes 50-50 with it him. It does go 50-50 with him. I love Bill. I love Bill. We, I will say that we probably did butt heads a little bit in the, in the, in the training aspect of it. Um, just because we were, he was taking us back to ground, you know, back to the, you know, bumping and feeding and this and the snaps and the, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, I've already learned how to do all this stuff, <laughs> you know. But not his way. But not his way, right. right. And, um, you know, so it was kind of like. It, you felt like almost at that time, which I didn't see, you know, I it, look at it differently now than I did, but I was just like, why are we, I already know how to take a clothesline. I don't know why I got to take 10 of them. But, you know, you kind of appreciate it after the fact, you know, because it was more about ring conditioning and being able to, you know, snap and mm -hmm. pop and to be able to go. Because and in reality, for television, you have sometimes, there's been times when I've had matches and then, and, and, looking and thinking of going out there we had eight minutes and we get to gorilla for whatever reason and it's cut to four you mm -hmm. know and then you're like spastic so you're walking around on eggshells for two and a half years you'd have six months left in your original deal and is there been any talk at that point about bringing you up to tv um well i was supposed to debut five times before i actually debuted in fact coming back to punk and i punk and i debuted on um sunday night heat mm -hmm. Uh, we did a match, and I was his valet. I was his manager. And we come back through the curtain, and um, I remember it was Hunter was standing right there, and they were like, we love you both. Like, you're awesome, and you're awesome, but you too. And I don't know why they thought that we, probably because they saw, like, I don't know if the writers or whoever thought, like, well, they work together in Ring of Honor. They'll obviously work together well here. It's just one match. Like, we love you, we love you, we do not love you two together. Like, you just do not belong together. It's interesting they made a decision off of one. Right. And I don't know who was behind the curtain and who made that call or who was like, why did we put these two out there together? You know, like, I don't know. But in, in hindsight, it was probably a blessing for us both. Mm -hmm. You know, because you think about, like, if that would have been our in, if that would have been how we both <clears throat> debuted, where would we both be right now? Well, after five false starts and, and one miss, you actually <laughs> did get your, your call up, and you actually, you got a dream spot. I, mean, I did. A, I mean, unbelievable entry spot for, for I, you. I was very fortunate. I was very blessed in that aspect. And what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, they told us in, you know, in developmental, like, don't be afraid to come up with ideas. Don't be afraid to come up with characters. Pitch them to us. If we like them, that'll be great. If we don't, that's okay. You know, so all of us, not just myself, anybody, you know, we were all trying to come up with characters or pitching new characters or shooting promos of different characters and coming up with storylines. And I sat down, and I'd written a couple different I sat down and wrote 18 weeks of television for this character, Mickey James, who was Alexis Lurie at the time for Alexis Lurie. Um, 
as this crazy, not psycho, but like crazy, super ecstatic, excited fangirl who was also, who had become a wrestler. And I was a super fan of Lita. And the reason why I wrote it about Lita is because A, Lita and I had a bit of history, mm -hmm. uh, you know, working the independence and stuff. I, I really accredit, like Lita really pulled, I felt like she really pulled hard for me and really not only that, but she aided me in a lot of ways of like with advice when I would be working for Count Grog, you know, and North Carolina or whatever. And if she happened to be around the area and she would come to the show, she'd sit backstage and she was one of those, she'd be like, that was cool and that was cool and don't ever do that again. You know, that was absolutely horrible. And so, but I really learned a lot mm -hmm. from that. And so from that, I had, you know, I think she felt, I felt like she put in a good word for me and, and really helped me as far as getting my job with WWE in the first place. And then so um, when I was sitting down writing ideas, I actually asked her if it was okay if I kind of pitched this idea with her because I didn't want to just go out and pitch an idea with someone without, you know, because it seems a bit, it seems a bit cold. And then what if they love it? And then the person is like, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I kind of I pitched it based around her and um it was kind of the same deal, it was a bit of the same character in this whole kind of deal. And um, when we were going up to, I feel like we were going into Cincinnati, because whenever the, the television was close to developmental, we would go ahead and make the drive and we would all go up and we would work out in the ring for tryouts and kind of just for the bosses to kind of see where we were um, at that time. And um, they would also come through the you know, through OBW as well, like Arn came a few times and that was cool. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so when I was there, um, after I'd written the storyline, um, Michael Hayes pulled me aside and he goes, hey kid, and I'm like, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's like, so uh, we sat down and we read that storyline you wrote and I'm like, you did? And he goes, yep, Vince read it. And he really liked it and I go, oh, that's cool. You know, that's cool. He goes, yeah. Um, he goes, oh yeah, it was really good. It was, it was cool. He goes, well, he goes, if I were you, I, if you know, I would try to pull Vince aside if you get can talk to him at all and and just remind him that maybe that you wrote it and that you, you know, you know how to be that character. And I go, okay, okay. So here I am all day. It sounds like a case of truth and dare. Hey, go up cool. to the boss. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> no. So here I am all day, like trying to. And then I remember I went to Vince and I go, um, Mr. McMahon. And he's like. Yes. <laughs> um, I was like, if, if you know, you get a moment, can I can I please talk to you whenever you get a second? He goes, sure. So here, so now I'm work, working on what I'm going to say and working up this courage to talk to Vince because I don't know if you've ever had a chance to sit there and talk to Vince or even like be in the same room. He's got this aura about him that is very impressive and it can be very intimidating. And um, especially at that level, the level that I was at, I was extremely intimidated by him. Um, and so I'm sitting there, and it's after the show, and I'm waiting by the door of his office, and I'm shaking in my boots, like absolutely paralyzed with, with nerves. And um, he finally comes, and he's like, oh, yeah, come on, you know, step in the office. And I'm like, okay. So And then I sat there, and I was like, um, Mr. Man, I heard that you, you know, that you read this story that I that I wrote, and I just want you to know that, you know, I, I'm I'm truly grateful that you liked it, and I, I want you to know that I know this character through and through, and there's nobody that can play this character like me. And I had said this to myself probably about 20 times just mm -hmm. before he'd walked up, so I didn't I didn't really stutter that much. But um, he's like, "Wow, okay, kid." He's like, "You got balls." I remember, and I was like, what? "Okay, it's awesome." He goes, "Okay, well." And then it was like six months later, because then I'm sit go back there, and then I'm like six, you know, six months go by, and I'm like, oh no, did I You're make like, the wrong? Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should not have done that. No, and then we came in, and they pitched, you know, they started this this whole angle, and I didn't even bother to call or text or anything with my parents or anybody in my family until I was actually standing in a gorilla, because at that point, like, I had gotten my hopes up so many times. Right. You didn't want someone to turn in and like, oh, once again, it doesn't. Happen. Yeah, want, want, want. So, and it, you know, and it's, it's, it was even better because I think to go, like, it, I think, I wonder how, you know, it's one of those things of like, and I've said this a couple times, like how my career would have played out differently had they gone with Lita instead, but she was involved and she was a heel at that time. 
and Trish is obviously like she was the pinnacle of the women's division and I felt like I I didn't know Trish that well and I I really bonded with her in the making of Mickey James and she really helped me to mold who I was going to be you know throughout the rest of my career really so so how far before it started did you know that your your stalking angle is going to be with Trish and not with Lita um pretty much when I got to TV when I got to TV that day it was like okay well we're gonna you know we're gonna work on this character and this and it honestly out of those 18 weeks of TV probably three of my ideas actually flew on TV you know like it was you know obviously rewritten and reworked with myself with Trish with Stephanie with the writers with Brian Gerwitz like with all these people that kind of really molded this and made it into what it was you know so I'm still pretty proud of the fact that I hey, a I sat down matter. and wrote that, 18 that, weeks that of horrible TV. TV. Right. <laughs> no, it was it couldn't have been that horrible, but like it was it was cool. <clears throat> you know, how many pitches do you think that they get? But I bet you most of them are like this is what I think, but there's no follow up. You, you know, know, and the that hardest was, part is to write, be getting to the very end and and have it and that, be convincing. And that's it. And and you know, there was probably 10 ideas that I'd thrown, maybe even more of ideas that I'd thrown at the wall with them, um, but they were all in just like a single paragraph, like, hey, what about this idea of I come in and do this? You know what I mean? But there wasn't really any substance to it, but that sitting down, I mean, it probably took me a month to really sit down and like analyze like who this character was, where she's from, what she's about, and what her angle is, you know, to really kind of, it was like a, it was like a homework project. Back in school. So you go back and you watch the single white female movie. You do your research. I do. <laughs> do a little studying. When you when you get called up to TV, does uh, do you renegotiate a contract at that point, or because you're still on your original deal? Do you I was just... still underneath my original deal until it was a couple months after I deb debuted on TV that they moved me over to a TV deal. That must feel better too, because you know you're you're walking on eggshells this whole time, seeing all these people cut out of developmental, and this is your first. TV contract. Right, right. And when you're still walking on eggshells, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're so nervous and you finally kind of made it to that level, but you hadn't made it yet, if that makes any sense. No, it does. Um, so, well, it's a lot of walking on eggshells. You know, because you, because it's weird because in wrestling, we all, like, a lot of people have really sensitive egos. You, you know, sure do. so. I do. What? You, you as a collective you. <laughs> yeah. You no, it is. And it's, it's, it's weird because, you know, you think like you're massive superstars and, and all these, like, obviously you've worked really hard to get, but I think it's because of, for the most part, a lot of people have struggled so hard to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, you feel like it could all be taken away in an instant. So everything is a threat, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps. And, and it's a, a locker room where you need to work with certain girls, but they're all your competition too. There's only... Right so many spots to go around. Yeah, think about it, like, especially in the women's division, there's one championship, you know? Mm -hmm. Whereas, at least with the guys, there's like the tag team and, and, you know, the world champion and the USA champion, like it's it's at least a couple different levels where you can kind of go go after different things, whereas in within women, you're either A, managing somebody, or you're trying to go after the women's championship, or the Divas championship now, and, you know? And everything else is expendable. Exactly. Yeah, or you're on the Ferris wheel, depending right. on what part of the rotation you're on. Yeah. About a month after you started TV, Eddie Guerrero passed away. Yeah. Uh, take us through what that did in the locker room and how that changed, I guess, the business model for WWE, particularly as it relates to the way they did testing and performance enhancing drugs. Right. I, and I'm, I'm not, you know, it wasn't really, it was more, I feel like, um, that was a very sad day. And I'm like, I had met Eddie and shaken, you know, shaken his hand several times and he was very cordial and very sweet. But I, I didn't know Eddie like a lot of the people um, did at that time because I was still fresh on the, on the road and I'd only met him through mostly tryouts and, and I hadn't really been there very long before, before he passed away. I just remember how, what a dark cloud it put on that entire day, you know, of, and even afterwards, you know, it was just a, it was, it was really hard. I think for the entire locker room because I felt like he touched. I think you know he just touched so many people's lives and careers and just he's one of those. I wish I would have known him better after you know 
knowing enough about him, I wish I would have been able to have that chance to have some sort of relationship just to get to know him because from what I understand, he was just such, you know, an amazing individual. Um, but that definitely, I feel like between that and then obviously the, the Benoit thing is what really kind of changed. That's what really changed, I think, people's perception of a lot of things and, and how things were were done moving forward within the testing and within concussions and, um, you know, not taking that as lightly or, you know, I, I can tell you that I've, you know, probably been knock loopy, you know, enough more times than I can count, you know, and you just kind of keep going because that's your mindset. You know, you're just so used to working through the pain and working through, but it was, at, you know, we, we really started to take that a lot more seriously. And, uh, yeah. It's Were there sad. any type of change in protocols that you got as a talent from the management on the way drugs would be tested? Because, you know, I know a lot of people were critical of WWE and, and kind of like they didn't address the issue, but I feel like you have to judge WWE by what they're doing now and how they've reacted to things that they've learned. Um, It's always easier to judge from an outside perspective, right? Like if you're not in it. But, like, there was a lot of things that were going on within the company that probably weren't, like, just, you know, released as public knowledge, obviously, and, and for, I think, smart reasons, you know, like, at the end of the day, we're still a big family, and, and, and those those events will really, you know, really, like, touched a lot of people in different ways, and I uh, think that, you know, that's stuff that you you can't predict happening, or, you know, you just don't see coming, but, and then you can only deal with the aftermath the best way, you know, how, and I feel like, obviously, they started outsourcing for and using pretty much the same same protocol that the NFL uses, you know, as far as their testing stuff, and and it became more public instead of just being within the company as it was before. It became a little bit more public knowledge because it was outsourced mm -hmm. um, through like this this big company. Um, but yeah, I, and I don't think that it was any less like they did. It's not like they never tested before because they did. Obviously, you know, you, you had to get tested before you even got a job and you, you know, had to go through random testings whenever. Um, but it became more prominent and more often. And, you know, the thing is with us, it's like it's not like you're just getting tested when your season's around. I mean, our season is year long. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how that's all I got. To, I mean, I don't know. It's one of those things. It's like it. You kind of just, like I said, you have to deal with the aftermath the best way you kind of know how. True. Going back to the Trish Stratus storyline, uh, again, you had a primo spot of making a debut. I mean, you know, a spot that most girls would dream of starting off on TV with. Uh, I want to fast forward a little bit to the WrestleMania match, your first WrestleMania and your match with Trish Stratus. Yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, you had somebody on the front row, right? My mom. My mom how, how does was out mom score front row tickets to wrestle? Well, it was more, you know, because she's obviously like, you know, the WWE, we have this section sectioned off for your family and your friends or whatever. And so technically she probably wasn't in the front row, but in my mind, you know, it's just yeah. one of those things of like, I she was the only person that came with me to WrestleMania that year. And um, at that point, because I was so nervous and I was still walking on eggshells, and um, when I found out that I was actually wrestling WrestleMania, I was over the moon. You know, like, that's the thing that you dream about, you know, like when I was a little girl going, oh, I'm going to be a wrestler. Like, you say it as a kid and you're joking around and, you know, and when you first, first step foot in the ring, you know, that's your goal. Like, for me, that was my goal was WrestleMania and was to win the women's championship and to be the greatest women's champion of all time. Like, you say that from, at least I did, and... I could have been blowing smoke up my own butt, but at the same time, that's what I ingrained in myself, like that was my goal. And um, to finally get to WrestleMania and to realize that you're in the women's championship match was, it was, you know, it was just overwhelming, you know? And then my mom's there and then she's cheering me on and she's seen me struggle the whole way, seven years worth of struggle to try to get to this one moment, you know, it was like, it, it was it was one of those feelings, like, I just wish that I could take that feeling that I had, because I can't even explain it. Like, the feeling that I had in my heart and, and just that day all together and bottle it up and share it with the world because it was that amazing. 
you know, because, I mean, I still get emotional thinking about it. Like, that was the moment that I realized that I'd finally, I finally made it. Like, this was it. So no, we're not walking on eggshells after that particular moment. Oh, of course I am. <laughs> of course I am. Yeah. Constantly walking no, on eggshells. No, but you feel like you, you have a place now. And, yeah, and... I, it was one of the, when I finally realized, like, I finally made it to the level that I dreamed about making it, mm -hmm. you know, to where I had respect, I felt like, in the fans' eyes. I had respect in the locker room's eyes. And I was a legit female wrestler. And now I was a legit women's champion. And and this was real. This is real life. Like, this really is happening. Mm -hmm. So there was an urban legend about this match that uh, at the end of the match, you, know, you were doing an angle where, you know, it was kind of like a lesbian-esque angle with uh, Trish Stratus. Yeah. And at the end of the match, towards it, you, you grabbed her and, and made a, made a, uh, gesture. a gesture. And urban legend was that Vince McMahon flipped his shit. It was an urban legend. Who told you that? I you just read things. You just read things. Oh, is that true? Did you get did you get some uh, let's say negative feedback? I did get one? a little bit of negative feedback, and it was okay. So this moment, like a throughout this match, I am just completely lost in the moment. But prior to this, I had asked my agent Steve Kern um, at the time. I said, "Hey, you know, I'm gonna grab her crotch." You know, so what if I lick my finger like so? Right. And he's like, oh, well, mm, ha, ha. I don't really see a problem with that. Like, it would just be, you know, oh, sure. Why? Okay. Or whatever. So in my mind, I'm going, okay, I could do that. Or I could do this, <laughs> which would be awesome. And I thought Vince McMahon is going to flip his lid in a positive way. Sure. Going to think it's the most amazing thing and why didn't he come up with it? Because it was awesome. I mean, this is the man who's had his ass kissed on TV, you know, by, by many people. So I'm like, this is going to be awesome. He's going to love it. Absolutely love it. I'm going to win so many brownie points. So I didn't obviously go further than this. With I didn't tell him, my agent. I really didn't even tell, I didn't tell Trish. Like, all they thought I was going to do was lick the finger. So even Trish knew the finger was coming. She knew that I was going right. to lick my finger. She, no idea. Cause, and if you look, watch, I turn away right. and do this. And then she kicks me in my face. Right? So, in my, but in my mind, I thought it was going to be an epic moment. It was going to be something that people would remember forever. Oh, I remember it. <laughs> And the thing is, is that a lot, many people, and the only, the thing is, is if you don't have it, if you didn't videotape it yourself, because when I came back through the curtain, like here I am on cloud nine, I just won the women's championship, just had this epic match and where the people were just completely insane the entire time from bell to bell. And, um, I'm over the moon. And the first thing <laughs> when I walk through the curtain is Vince is livid. Like, absolutely, like, how could you do that? That was so crass. Like, you know, we're going to have to go back and edit this out of the DVD, and do you know how much time and how much effort and how much money it's going to cost to do that just because you decided to do this? And I'm like, I'm begging for mercy and, and so sorry, you know, because that's not what I expected at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, hey, you win some, you lose some. Like, I feel bad in the sense because I know how annoying it was now to go back and edit all that, and probably it would have been... Oh, that's a lie. Listen, we do editing. It didn't cost that much. Don't, <laughs> don't let it make no, it No, but, you know, it's one of those things of, like, this it was this amazing moment, but I tell you what, it was, it's, a, it's a hell of a story. To, it, and it made that it made that moment even more memorable, I think, for me because I'll never remember, I'll never forget being on cloud nine and then walking into Dad just yelling at you going... Shaking. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I honestly thought he would well, love listen, it. We always talk about creating WrestleMania moments, and you created your own. How about that? Congratulations. Thank you. And it, it seems Even like, if you can only find it on YouTube. That's right. <laughs> the power of YouTube. And uh, yeah, I'm sure he reacted negatively, but he probably popped for it too. I hope he did. He did. Deep down inside. I think he did. Because I thought he would have loved it. Well, I mean, it didn't get you fired, but. It did not. But so you go from being on one half, you're on Cloud Nine, you just won the women's title at the biggest show of the year, having a great match, which 
I don't want to take anything away because usually they throw that girls match in as like time, you know, between two other great matches to kind of get people's, you know, heads around the idea like, wow, I just saw a great match. I'm about to see another great match. Let me stick the women's match in there. But, right. A little but, fluff. Yeah. But you weren't, a, that wasn't a fluff match. No. I'm, I'm very fortunate because there's very few, I feel like there's probably a handful of women's matches, WrestleMania moment matches that had been, you know, at that same level with that much the beauty of our i felt like of our storyline is that when it culminated at wrestlemania it was six months of telling the story and building it and building this arc to when we finally got there and, and chicago it was it was insane like i did i'll tell you what a le real reaction was for me was when we got out there and the crowd split mm -hmm. i expected to get booed out of the building and for trish to get cheered you know what i mean the raptor just to be blown off with awesomeness neither one of us expected i don't think that split of let's go trish let's go mickey chicago is a funny town it is a funny town and when that happened i mean i got i was just like this i had this like crazed stare in my face because it was a legit reaction of going holy shit like this what is happening you know and it was just and that's where I kind of like really just started to lose myself in the moment, you know, and, and stop worrying about everything else because that's when you realize like, we got them. This this is what we've worked so hard for. Like it's it's right here. So you come back. Obviously, Vince isn't happy about the one spot, but does that really take away from you being on cloud nine that night? Not really. I was I was bit because I you know you don't worry like I was worried about it then and I felt really really bad because it's one of those things of it's like it was a humbling moment because you're on cloud nine and then you get snapped back into reality just like that you know what I mean of like which has probably happened dozens of times in your career absolutely absolutely and it's the reality of the wrestling business <laughs> you know so don't get too high on your pedestal right but um, it didn't really it took I was still on cloud like I was still really really happy but there was that bit of worry then of going like oh crap like I wonder how mad he is like are they gonna they're just gonna take the title away from me tomorrow at raw I really messed up like you know what I mean like I thought he was gonna love it I don't know what happened in one of the rematches Trish I think separated her shoulder mm. did did a lot of the did you get any like flack for that no no none whatsoever and that god that that whole match like after that like we had, obviously like that that tumble that she did she's done that a ton of times and we had to pretty much like cut out everything else because there was nothing she could do it was completely separated mm -hmm. and what we didn't realize at that at that moment until after the fact and what she realized as she was taking the tumble is that the stairs were right there mm -hmm. and the stairs are usually never there so in order to try to compensate for taking that tumble she tried to get around the stairs and that's where her shoulder blew out and that sucked because it was like it was supposed to be this really amazing aftermath moment of where I was you know really gonna get my tail handed to me um, and then it just kind of you know after the after that happened it's like where do you go there's mm -hmm. nothing that you can kind of do um, so I kind of want to play a, a, like a, a, maybe a, a list of names of girls that were in the locker room with you at the time, and if there's anything that stands out, whether matches with them or just a funny story, just, just to try to cover some of the girls that were in the locker room at the time. Melina was kind of starting around that time as well. Do you have any memories of working with or about Melina? Well, Melina was actually debuted well well before me. Oh, it was before you? Yeah, because um, she was with Eminem, um, and we also were in... OVW together and I think it was tough especially with that whole um, locker room for all of us because we're all trying everybody's trying like you said before we're all trying to go to the same place and I didn't know Melina particularly well we hung out a few times and we obviously trained together but I don't especially at that point I don't feel like we were like super tight or even super best of friends um, but I think that she you know not only does she have the most amazing entrance ever probably especially for the women um but like to mold and, and become that you know character with Eminem and to go on and then she you know to start in the people's eyes even though she was wrestling in OVW to start in the people's eyes as this manager and then mold into this champion mm -hmm. and I think my favorite match with her was the false count anywhere match where we kind of wrestled all throughout the building and we did that locker room scene where you know right. it was so much fun and um 
Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think she's incredible. She's an incredible performer. She's an incredible personality, you know, and she's a live wire, that's for sure. Well, that live wire, she, you know, one of the things people remember her for is because she is a live wire and she made a lot of waves backstage and caused a lot of drama, but... She's a hellcat, <laughs> as JR you, would say. Do you learn from someone like that and you're like, hey, I can make some waves, but I can't make that many waves because it, it hurts someone like her career who is very talented, but... Um... You know, we all make our decisions. We all make smart decisions and we all make stupid decisions, you know? And I can't sit here and say that any of the decisions that she made positively or negatively affected my career, just like, because she's the one who can who can attest that mm -hmm. as to what how it truly affected. So I've made it a point of to, to not sit there and, and judge or even attempt to, to you know, justify or anything of, of somebody else's decisions because who she is in the ring and who she is as a performer that's what I respect because I'm the one who had to work with her and work those matches with her and she is mega talented and I think that she was an amazing personality and you don't get that kind of connection with the fans without being having a genuine love and a genuine passion about the business itself regardless of whatever decisions you made outside of the ring about a girl that you you have a long history with, Victoria. <laughs> Vic, I love her. She's funny. She's so funny. She's she's just as crazy as I am. I think that's why we get along so well is because we're both ridiculous. Um, I think the the one thing with with Lisa with you know that I respect the most about is that she when she when we're in the ring we both bring it. Like, we bring every ounce of what we have. And we may apologize later or apologize the next day when we're really feeling it. But when we're in the ring, we 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 just go for it. And every single, I feel like she's always been one of those people who have, tried, who have taken me to the limit. And I felt like I've done the same with her. And um, the thing is, is that even, in WWE, I didn't really get a chance to work with her as much as I did when I and when I came into TNA mm -hmm. and um, it was just awesome it was because we really like I was in a it was in a place of really wanting to prove myself in a different in a different aspect um, because I was a bit I was a bit torn as to whether either even to come to TNA in the first place and then I was a bit kind of not jaded but it, I was a bit like, I didn't, I wanted my people to take my, my career of what I was, you know, who I was in the ring seriously, you know what I mean? And like kind of change, change the, like the way people looked at women's wrestling. Um, so I was able to, I felt like I was really able to do that with her because she was kind of mentally in that same place of like, because we've worked so hard and trained so hard, I think that you want to be respected just like any other guy in the locker room as far as your ability when you go out there as a personality and as a performer, you know. This seems like a good time to interject this this thought. Uh, the Diva Search just became popular around this time as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you you cracked into the business the hard way as we talked about. You put in you put in the time and then there were some other people who had a, who had immediate access to T V through the Diva Search. What what were your opinions on the, the Diva Search process and Then or now? Then. Then I was how do I say this? Um, then I was I was a bit on that on that thought process of like this is bullcrap. Like I I'm glad you said that because now yeah, I know you're talking the truth. Yeah, that was like this is this is this sucks because here I am. I've I've sacrificed six at this point six almost seven years of my life because this is what I want it to be. It wasn't that I want it to be a television star. It wasn't that I want it to be on TV and I felt like this was an easy way in. This was what I have dedicated. This is what I have driven tens and, you know, 12 hours for for $100. I've slept in my car, I've stolen gas, I've eaten out of tuna cans and nuts and, you know, just trying to make it, just trying to survive. That <laughs> I truly wanted this and this this sucks, you know. Um, and I don't mean that to sound bitter because I love each and every single one of those girls. Sure. And but then even as I was in OVW, it's and, the process that you're criticizing, not the girls. Yeah, no, and and now looking at it in in hindsight, and even after the fact, 
I'm still grateful of the way I came in because of this fact. Like I, I completely respect all those girls. And there are certain girls who've even taken it to another level and have made it a point to be looked at as a serious competitor in the ring. You know what I mean? And, and really up their game and, and to be seen out of that as not just an, a diva search girl. But I felt like it, it did bring some um, pop culture kind of new wave into the WWE and into the divas division. And it, and it brought that little bit of spice and edge. Um, but when you are trying to make it and you're making a third of what these girls who have never wrestled a day in their life for, and you're teaching them how to grab a headlock, it can be frustrating because it's like, that's, it's not fair, but life isn't fair. No. And no. And you know, you think about it, like had I come in that way, I wouldn't have been able to build the career for myself that I had and everybody has their own paths. So, yeah. And, and that was a time when Playboy and WWE were really uh, associated. They were doing an annual cover every year. Uh, you know, and we talked about this before the interview. Uh, you, you actually had discussions with Playboy about appearing in the magazine. Well, I had discussions with WWE, you know, with, with WWE, WWE about, about po the possibility of doing Playboy and if I would have been open to it. And at that time, I felt like, well, yeah, I would have been open to it, you know, and and, but at the same time, the girls that were doing Playboy weren't the, they were more of along the diva search line. Or even prior to that, you know, it was Sable and it was Tori, and it, they weren't the in-ring wrestler aspect. And I felt like I had separated myself enough away from that to, I didn't know if I would be going backwards, mm -hmm. you know. And it wasn't that I completely closed off the idea. It was just that I was, I was, I was too on the fence about it to even commit to it, you know. Um, and and I'm sure that other girls probably turned it down, and I'm sure that the girls that did it, like it, it was pretty amazing, and they looked absolutely stunning, you know. It's like you have to, it's just... Did yeah. you ever get to the point where you actually negotiated money with Playboy? Or with no, Playboy? no, it wasn't even to that, that point. It was more of like, I kind of threw a ballpark figure out there and really overshot it of like, this was what it, you know. So you'd say, this is what it would take for One billion dollars. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, so that was that. Okay. Do you look at girls that appeared in Playboy any differently? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. No, no. The thing is, is that we've all, I mean, even through life, we've all made decisions. And Playboy is, is not only is it the classiest of, of them uh, all together, but it's like, I thought they were, every, every single girl that's done it has looked absolutely stunning when they've done them. Mm -hmm. You know, they look beautiful and... Yeah, they looked all right. <laughs> they looked all right. They looked beautiful and they looked classy and it was just... You know, it's just an expression of art, really, you know. Uh, another subject I want to talk about while we're talking about this. Uh, right now, WWE does, generally does not hire girls that have, let's say, nudity in their past, their modeling. And I know there's a lot of girls that probably you see them all the time at these indie shows. They're trying to break into the business or even not even, not even at the first day of school, but that you know they want to be wrestlers. Right. What would, you, what would you give them in terms of advice when they get approached to do, like, modeling that may or may not affect their wrestling career well it's a different world today than it is or than it was i'd say and look i'm i can't sit here and tell you i, I tell you what like the decisions i've made in my life some of them not have may not have been the smartest decisions and they may not have been the best decisions but they have molded me and helped me get to where i am today and some of them have hurt me in some aspects and some of them have really helped me but i've learned from each and every one of them so i can't sit here on a pedestal and tell you what you should and you shouldn't do but i can tell you that every decision you make especially if it's something that's in in a public eye will even fifteen years after the fact will follow you you know and and so just be cognizant of that as sometimes you, it's hard to figure out, like, well, if my goal is to work for WWE, to even realize what anything you do now right. will have an effect on you later. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you don't, and some of those times, like, you don't think, you don't really think that it would be a hindrance. You know, you just think, like, whether A, you need the money, or B, you're in that in a odd place in your life. And, and, and granted, like, you know, we all kind of go through rocky roads, you know, so I, I get it. Um, but you don't, you don't, sometimes you don't think about the afterbirth until 
it's too late. How do you, know? you keep the big long-term picture in mind when you're dealing with all those struggles? Um, you kind of, I just, you know what, I just kind of visual, try to visualize where I want to go, you know, and like I said, like it's, you don't always make the best decisions and sometimes they seem like the right decisions at that moment and it, it, you just try to stay positive, I think. If that's, the, the best thing for you to do is like just to try to think positively and stay positive and make those decisions moving forward. And it's taken me a long time to come to that, you know, because we all go through struggles and we all go through crap, that's for sure. And, and my life is in no way has been a big cupcake, you know, but I'm very grateful for the way it's, it's gone. In addition to Trish Stratus, you got to be in a very high profile uh, program with Alita. Just talk about yeah. how much Alita's meant to your career and, and uh, specifically memories of working with her on a national stage. Uh, it was incredible. And, you know, it's, I was, I was fortunate enough to work with Trish and not only at WrestleMania, but on her way out as she retired at Madison Square Garden. And I was very fortunate to be in Lita's last angle as far as, especially because she had kind of stepped out of the in-ring persona. She had been transferred over to more valet and did the comeback and do her last, like, real women's angle with with her and for someone who had not only helped me along the way and 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 trying to make it but had been so cool with me and given me advice in pretty much every aspect of my life you know um from my career to personal you know to be able to be a part of a her history on her her way out and it was a bit sad for me I think too because I feel like that was that was the last of that generation that when I was getting into the business that those were the people that I wanted to work with that I wanted to be on the same level as and she was kind of that was the last of them you know she kind of left and then it was the new generation it was myself Melina um, it was Beth and Jillian, and then obviously it was Candace and Maria, and, and at that time Kelly. Kelly was coming in, so it was just a whole new, it was a transformation of a locker room, you know. And and the transformation is now that Lita and Trish had left, like you're about the most veteran, most tenured girl there. Well, <laughs> well, well uh, I mean, I... I guess in a sense, you know, you're I never in your really. You're twenties and you're the veteran of the girls' locker I was, room, right? I, I didn't really see it that way, I guess, because I was still, you know, I've, I, I was still in that aspect of like a walking on eggshells and sometimes making stupid decisions. But in a way, it was, it really was. It was like Beth, Melina, myself, and Jillian were really like uh, the workers of the locker room, you know, and. Um, it was it was cool to have that. I don't know that there was an official torch passed in the sense to that to that aspect or whatever, but I felt like um, I was just extremely honored to be able to work with them on their way out. You know, like it it was it was a very fulfilling and sad moment all at the same time. Do you ever feel like uh, jealousy is not the right word? I'm jealousy, not, I'm jealousy, not, jealousy. I'm not sure envy is either, but do you ever have envy for how Trish and Lita and, um, yeah, Trish and Lita, I guess I'll stick to, have basically gotten out of wrestling and, and they've kind of gotten whatever it is they're doing with their lives? I mean, I know it's, there's nothing wrong with saying that you're a wrestler and stuff, but I know this mentality of a wrestler is always like, I, I know I only have a certain amount of time as a successful pro wrestler, what am I going to do after that? Oh, I mean, I'm not, no, envy, no, or jealousy, no. I'm extremely proud of them to be able to do it, to do that, to be able to step out of the business and go out the way they want. And I feel like, um, and to be able to move on with their lives and to go after the things that they want to go after and, and to be successful in that. Um, I think that the aspiration for anyone male or female in the business is to be able to step out the kind of way that you want to and the retire in a positive light and walk away and I don't think that you'll ever completely walk away from the wrestling business it's it's very few and far between that completely shut the door and never look back um, 
but we all do aspire for that. And I don't, you know, I don't think that in either company that I've been at the point where it's the way that I want to end my career. But, you know, sometimes you have to look at it and be like, it's God's plan. It's not your plan, you know. And I don't feel like this is the end-all, be-all of my wrestling career whatsoever. Like, I have way too much I still want to do, and I think that I have way too much to offer. Or at least I hope, in some aspect. Oh, we haven't even talked about the other half of your career yet. <laughs> last year, Trish got inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And uh, we were talking, you... You uh, you wanted to go there. I really did want to go. I wanted to go badly because it was, it's one of those things of like being inducted into the Hall of Fame is like this. It's it's that it's that admiration of of being respected not just in the fans' eyes but in your peers' eyes and in the company's eyes. You know of, of achieving that that level of of respect and to see one of who I feel is my dear friends, to be able to watch her, you know, have that moment of glory would have been incredible. And unfortunately, I was not um, able to attend that, even though I was in the city. Um, because you, of... Because you were under contract to uh, TNA wrestling at that time? <laughs> yes, apparently it was... It was <coughs> not... What explanation were you given why it would not be... Because it was a conflict of interest. But they let Ric Flair go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's okay. I mean, it sucked. It sucked because then, you know, I'm sitting in, in town and I'm hearing about Trisha's speech and how she's commending pretty much everyone in the locker room, including myself and Lita and Molly and Jacqueline. And, like, she's given this incredible speech. And, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't even there to applaud her. And, and I wasn't, you know, I didn't even want to be in the spotlight. Like, hey, there's, I just... Wanted to. I was there in well, you spirit. You were part of the. I was you there were part of the spirit. Hall of Fame career that she had. I was I mean, in there so, in spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you think you think Lita's deserving of a, a Hall of Fame induction? Absolutely. You think about the fan base that she's had and she still has, that has followed her. You know, and and she was one of those women like a. She was more of like that. She brought that whole kind of the moon salt and the that luchadori esque esque style as far as to the women's division and really like and captured a different type of audience you know um that whole the the hardy boys and the mm -hmm. you know like that whole side of the wrestling the wrestling personalities and, and fans i think that she really encaptured them and she's still one of the most over females in the industry i think and and absolutely i mean she's definitely honoring why do you think she's going in this year she might. She you know, might, and she deserves her name, it. Her name's being talked about. Yeah. Uh, someone who's already in, uh, and just to put a time stamp on this uh, interview, is just days ago we lost Mae Young. Yeah. And I know that she wasn't a regular for WWE while you were working there, but she certainly came and went a few times. Maybe you have a, a memory or a story about oh, Mae Young. Oh, she was amazing. I mean, her, she was like a ray of sunshine always. Like, she was always smiling, and she was just happy to be there and she was just so loving and she had this smell about her it's always very floral i remember this and it was probably you know obviously her perfume but and who her and, and mula both were always incredible and i was honored to be able to um work with them and chat with them and just kind of get to know them on some level and like obviously it wasn't on this super deep level um but just to have those those few moments to, of you know to remember, and what I'll never forget is that um, May would always wear this bright red lipstick, and it was like color stay. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, this lipstick did not go anywhere but on my cheek apparently, <laughs> and when it went on the cheek, it didn't come off unless you absolutely washed your face and. Um, I'll never forget. It was, and I can't even remember what match. It was like a, it was a, you know, six girl tag match or something like that. But I saw them in the hallway, you know, prior to it, it was about 10 minutes before the match and give them a big hug or whatever. And May kisses my cheek. I don't think anything of it until I'm going through, about to go through Gorilla and I, you know, doing the hair fluff or whatever. And there's bright red lips on my face 
Bright before I'm getting ready to go. And I wrestled with Bright because I couldn't even try to, because I mean, right. I just, I attacked this monster so many times that I knew that either A, I was going to try to wipe it and it was going to be red all over my face. And I didn't have enough time to go to Jan and make up to tell her, ask her to fix it. And so I kind of just pretty much wrestled with her lips on my face. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't like massive. It was just kind of like the, yeah, that was pretty cool though. Just uh, just so we reference some of the, the other names that you kind of worked with and if any stories pop up, uh, you worked a little bit with Ashley Massaro. Yeah. I did a little bit. I You know, it was um, we had that match where Trish was a special guest referee, mm -hmm. and uh, we wrestled that match. And obviously Ashley was very um, – she wasn't a wrestler. You know, she was she was a wrestler in some aspects. She's been training. She'd been training. That's the hardest part, I think, for, for – especially for the Diva Search girls is that – you're training in the spotlight, so you're growing as a performer. And by the time you really, for the most part, for a lot of them, like when they really start getting good, it's they've they've already they've wrestled so many t you know a couple of times in front of the audience to where it takes even longer to build that credibility as a, as a mm -hmm. wrestler. Um, but I know that at that time, like as far as females, some of like some of them weren't were preferred not to be seen as wrestlers anyway. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I love Ashley. She's, she's hilarious. She's fun. Um, I wouldn't say that our, our match that night was anything spectacular, but it was fun. And to have Trish as the, um, you know, the special guest referee, I'll tell you a funny story about that match Please is do. that, um, Trish, you know, the refs usually have earpieces, mm -hmm. uh, to have, you know, to know how long, you know, we have until commercial, yada, yada, yada. And this was pay-per-view or how long we have left in our thing. Well, Trish didn't have an earpiece. So we have to rely on, A, our own brains, which you can't trust, and the person on the floor, whoever that's kind of telling us where we're, where we're at. Um, and cardinal rule is, is that if you, you know, are given five minutes in a match, obviously, don't go more than five minutes, you know. Well, we went about four minutes over mm. our allotted time, and I spent the re and not realizing it because the match was just turned into a hot mess, and so in the in the attempts of trying to, you know, get it together, we ended up going way too far over, and I spent the rest of the night apologizing to people for going way too far over and taking their time and, and taking their time yeah. and and you know these are the people that are filling the seats that are that are these these are the these are the people who are the main event that's the reason why you're getting ready to you know you have the ability to do what you love to do is because these people are actually selling the tickets do you, and you know just, when you're in a hot mess match like you're in the middle of a hot mess match <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. who doesn't right you can just go oh my god what just happened <laughs> oh holy how do i fix this how do we fix this you know because you can't yeah. go time out, listen, let's change this, we'll go Especially, to the finish. And yeah, we'll it's here. live because it's live, and you just got to figure it out, you know. Let's figure it out. That's what makes this art. I, right, right. And, yeah. One of the things I, I wanted to ask you about with uh, Melina particularly, in, I think in your second title run there was some stuff that happened in France where there was a title change that wasn't supposed to happen. There was. There was. Take, take me through that because I, I don't have much of the details here. Yeah. It's a top secret. Okay. It's top, so I can't tell you the because secret today. I have to kill you after with this and I'll destroy the tape footage. What? You want me to kill you? Yes, I'll take oh, it. Oh, no. Um, so it's a, um, it's actually a three-way tag match. It was myself, Melina, and Victoria. Melina was the champion at the time. And we are in Paris, France, and we have this three-way dance for the women's championship. And Ricky Steamboat is the agent for the show. And I don't, if, have you ever met Ricky? Absolutely. Love him. He's hilarious. But he sits there and he's like explaining stuff to you. And he's got his little cup and he's looking over his glasses. And um, so we go out there and the match is going great. Like we're kicking, like because Melina's a hellcat. She brings it. Lisa brings it. I'm going to, you know, especially when I was in there with those two, we were all, you know, going to bring it. Well, something happened. I was covering Melina, and was I covering Melina or Victoria? I'm trying to remember. Anyway, I was making the cover. 
Yeah, I was covering Melina, and Lisa was supposed to break it up, I believe, mm -hmm. and she didn't get there in time. So the ref at this and at this juncture, we were going through this phase of like, no matter what, you just the ref has to do his ref. Job. The ref, right. you cannot. And that, that I think that's it was it was a valid point, and I think it's an amazing thing that we've done because it really has brought the credibility back to the referees. You know what I mean? Because you don't mm -hmm. want to put the heat on the referee because then it's in the wrong place, right? So he had to count to three, one, two, three. I'm the new champion, and we're going. Oh my God! And I can't. I hate to misquote it because I can't. This is what happens when your brain. Um, I felt like I was covering Melina and, and Victoria didn't get there for the pen, but it, it could have been I was covering Victoria and Melina didn't get there for the pen and I can't, for the life of me, remember the exact, I just remember after it was like, holy crap, and we get back to the thing and Ricky's going, oh my God, what has happened? What happened? How did this happen? Oh my God, how am I gonna fix this? And he's like, so he walks back and he goes, tell you what we're gonna do girls. Melina, you go back out there, you cut a promo, you challenge her to a rematch, this is bull crap, this is a three-way dance, this is bull crap, you shouldn't have lost the title that way. And I think that actually, you know what, it was, I was covering, I think I was covering Lisa and Melina wasn't there in time because that's how it, it culminated that Melina could go back there and, right. and regardless, she had to go back out there and cut the promo, challenge me to a rematch, here I come down, boom. We we get into it and we have a thing and then she steals it one two three and then rolls out she's the champion again so I was a champion in Paris for all of ten minutes fifteen maybe okay did you was there which any... solidified my fourth <laughs> and I know that like it's like it's it's a bit because it's not always in the record books but I think that they finally put it in the record books right. as an was legit there any win. repercussions uh, following no, it? no no just... not really because it's one of those things that happens I'll show Paris France who it happens it? yeah and it, in hindsight I'm like why didn't we just keep it that night and the next night I just drop you know but because then Ricky would have to go back to his box and explain what, what, <laughs> what happened. the heck happened like, oh, yeah we'll leave it here at exactly how we're supposed to be <laughs> yeah so it's funny because it's one those are the things of like you just never know like stuff happens Kelly Kelly was introduced to the WWE, and I, I kind of feel like she's the one who changed the WWE women's division, at least as it is now, for quite some period of time. It seems like they went, they had a change from the Trish Stratus, the Lita, the Mickey James era, to the Barbie doll era for a while. Mm -hmm. Did you kind of sense when Kelly came in that they were looking for something different for their face of the women's division? Um, poops. You know, she was so young when when she first came in um, that it was, she's very, like, she wasn't a wrestler by any means, and she was learning kind of, like, just the aspects of being a, a woman and, and a performer because she was just a baby, you know? Um, it's It was obvious, I guess, during the whole, that whole diva search kind of era when they started changing the mold from women's to divas that they were obviously trying to build a mold of, of something different and Kelly obviously fit that perfect mold I mean she's glamorous she's beautiful and she's funny and quirky you know um, so I guess I mean I, c I could see that I, I mean I love poops so, well, so you don't love them but you kind of feel like you're going in a little different direction than we've than I've been operating under for the last couple of years. Right, right, and it's like, well, where do you fit in in that that whole mold? But I felt like I did, you know. You, I feel like you need a little bit of everything. I recognize, I know that you need you need the hot chick and you need the wrestling chicks. You know, you need all of it. Like it doesn't just work with one or the other. You know what I mean? Or otherwise, if it if it's all one way, then you're not then you're missing out on the other side of it, you know. There's the sensational Sherry's and there's the Miss Elizabeth. You need both, you know, or else it doesn't doesn't mesh. And to survive in WWE, you need to really have a full range of uh, character, let's say. So they, they start you off, uh, you're, a, you know, in a lesbian interest with Trish Stratus, and then at some point they put you on a romantic relationship with John Cena for a few times. Yeah. Uh, where do you think they were headed with that? Because we only got a couple of uh, It, would, it weeks really of... didn't last very long. It was like just a couple of weeks. I don't know where they were headed with that or what, you know, it wasn't, it was just one of those things of like, hey, we're going to try to tease this idea of you two maybe romantically being, you know, involved and 
and that was that. And it like lasted like a month tops worth. Do and you then usually that's get it. to see far, like far ahead, and like when they start an angle like that or any other angle, do you usually get to see like, well, this is where we're going with it? So, uh, like, yeah, I mean, with some things, and obviously not with that one, um, but obviously with my angle with um, with Trish, we kind of help mold that and everything together. So like we had this idea of where it was going to go or hopefully going to go. Um, and I honestly didn't know it was going to go till to WrestleMania until it was getting close to WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, with, it depends, I guess it depends. It's a case by case scenario. They, they pulled the plug on that one and then they jump, you jumped from raw to SmackDown. Right. Did you, did you look at it as a demotion in any way, being from their flagship show on Monday nights to a tape show? Um, no, I didn't look at it as a demotion. I tell you what, um, and this was my, and and I kind of in hindsight wish I wouldn't have reacted the way I did, but I was a little bit, I was upset. I was I was really upset in the sense of it wasn't that I felt like it was a demotion by any means because SmackDown has incredible talent and it had, you know, at that time they were two different shows, they had two different locker rooms. But the entire stint of my career and my whole, that was my locker room, that was my family, that was who I traveled the roads with. Raw was where I felt at home. And I didn't know, I mean, aside from the occasional pay-per-view of working a few pay-per-views with, with the SmackDown, you know, or, or whatever, when we did the cross-promotional stuff, I really didn't know or work with a lot of the girls there or even a lot of the guys at the locker room. So it was more of a change so, of the uncomfortable change in talent. It was, and starting and over and, and that whole like rebuilding that trust and that where your place was in the locker room. It was that whole, that whole thing. And, and, you know, change can be a wonderful thing, but it can also be a very scary thing. And for me, I, I was scared. I was scared to death because it was, it was so unfamiliar and I was so comfortable and at home and in the raw locker room. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like at that point I felt like I had become one of the locker room leaders and I I was really like helping to mold the girls that were coming up in that in that locker room, you know, the Kelly Kellys and and so to be to have to move and so unexpectedly and just, you know, cuz I had no idea until that day and I was just what? Like what was happening and then even though you're not really saying goodbye to all these people, I mean, you're still going to see them at shows or whatever. It's just a big change, you know, and I was just kind of thrown back by it. Mm -hmm. And so I probably, I got a little bit more upset than I probably should have, you know, in hindsight. But Hindsight's always easier, It's isn't always it? easier, isn't it? Uh, one of the things, and it was kind of a, it could be perceived as a brutal thing, is that you were, you did the, the angle with Lay Cool, where they were calling you Miss Piggy, and it's, you know, for... Every girl's got to be sensitive because it's so hard to maintain their look being on the road all the time, and, and you're perceived a certain way. And yeah. to be to be in a spot where they're almost saying, "Hey, you're you're too big for this role." Right. And I'll tell you, and I'll I'll be completely honest. Um, I had let myself get a little bit more out of shape than I had ever in my career, and by saying that, I had allowed myself to gain five pounds. I weighed probably. 130 pounds, 131. Oh, that's huge, 130 it's pounds. massive. But on TV, I'm also 5'2". I'm 5'2", and everything looks. Mm -hmm. And I was, the, the pants that I was wearing at that point probably weren't the most body flattering. Like, I thought they were really cool. I came up with this cool design. I thought they were, like, awesome. And they were also very expensive to get made. Mm -hmm. um, they were probably the most expensive gear I had throughout the entire my entire career with those, like, cargo kind of pants with right. the stuff. Yeah. But... I thought they were super cool, but now, you know, looking at them and, and through the gears that I've had through, those are probably the less flattering of them all. Um, but yeah, so, um, and it's hard, you know, because at, at that point I'd been on the road for five years, 250 days out of the year. I burned the candle at both ends of the middle. I was also, that last year uh, with WWE, I was probably home 20 days that entire year because when I wasn't at home, when I wasn't on the road, I was in Nashville, and I was working on this new, this, my ver first album. Um, and when I wasn't there, like, I literally was home 20 days. I mean, and I find it, I find excuses not to be able to stay in shape 
being at home 365 it, days a year. And it wasn't that I wasn't working out. Right. It was just that right. I was stressed. I was tired, which I don't, I mean, anybody that knows anything about health and fitness, being exhausted and not getting enough sleep as well as stress will keep water weight and keep fluid on you. I was on the road instead of 200, 250 days out of the year, I was on the road like 300 plus days out of the year because I was also spending time in Nashville and I didn't have a home. I don't have a home in Nashville. So I was still eating as much as you try to eat healthy when you eat out. Like I just, I, I wasn't like my, my focuses weren't completely in staying in absolute best shape, which in turn I, I it suffered. And I, and, and I did look, that was probably like when I didn't look my absolute best. Um, so I don't think that I was, I was overweight by any means, but I did put on like five or six pounds, you know? And, um, so yeah, a little, well, was, but in, in terms I know the point of that angle was just to, you know, and they've really taken a lot of steps further with, uh, bullying. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was one of the first angles where they integrated bullying into. And that's what, lines. and that's what I felt like, um, that was the point of that. Like, not only was it, it was the point to get Michelle and Layla over in a sense to try to get some real reaction and real generate some real emotion behind them um because to that point that people like really started respecting michelle as a wrestler and they you know were starting to really really respect layla as a wrestler but as far as their that's the one thing about the wrestling business. In order to encapture the fans, you have to have that emotional mm -hmm. connection where the people actually care not just about who, you know, how you wrestle, but who you are and what you stand for and who you are as a performer, you know. And that's that was the one thing. And and perhaps that was the real reason why I got moved to SmackDown in the first place. And I don't feel that that angle was in by any means, at least I hope not because I like to see the 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 positive side. I don't think it was by any means to put me down. I feel like it was honestly a way to, because bullying, especially like in social media and in where it's really easy to sit behind a keyboard and tell people awful things because then you kind of just, you don't have to look the person in the eyes while you say it, right? Um, it becomes such a, a massive issue within the school systems and within society and it really become, you know, an issue that was brought to light that it was our way to really address it and show people how ugly and how harsh and how childish it really is, you know what I mean? And to attack it kind of head on. And really it got a lot of heat behind Layla and Michelle to where the people really started to hate them. And it brought even more sympathy on me, you know? So it, it really benefited us all and I feel like it was, it was a way to kind of shed some light on that. And it's still a glaring issue. Like, you sure. even see it now, today. And this happened towards the end of your uh, WWE run around mm -hmm. that time. And, and this is something where we're getting real personal here. One of the reasons that people claim you were let go is you had a really poor attitude towards the end of your run and that you were showed up late on some bus trips to uh, when you were over there in Europe. Do you... Uh, do you remember anything about that, or do you think any of those things are valid? Or? Um, perhaps there is some valid, uh, validity. Blah, blah, blah. Perhaps there is some truth in, in some of that. I don't think by any means I had a bad attitude. I think that, I mean, I think I would hope that whenever you speak to anyone about me, I never really had a poor attitude about about things. I love this business. I love it with all my heart. I've sacrificed and I've given so much I'm getting emotional I've given so much to do this I think that what my what my issue was was the the change of moving to Smackdown um, I had a lot of stuff going on in my personal life that was really I was battling with and to top that off I was exhausted I'm um, emotionally and physically and i had been working through, you know, that my own personal demons and not really demons, but my own personal issues mm -hmm. and working through trying to make this album and and really trying to be vigilant about that and maintaining who I was and not losing 
and not losing that in the WWE world and, and who I was as a wrestler because just because I felt like just because just because I um, was trying to make this music thing happen, I never in any ass like in any way wanted people to take that away from well she doesn't care about wrestling anymore. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that wasn't even remotely true. You know, like I loved wrestling more than I ever had, and I still love it. But I think it was the co the combination of all those things mm -hmm. that really I really I self destructed. You know what I mean? Yeah. And because of that reason, I, m I did make a few bad decisions, and I may have gotten a little drunk in England, and I may have missed the bus. And I don't know that that's the real reason that I got fired, but I tell you what, it w it surely didn't help. Sure. So, it is, it's, but then, it's you know, it's like, I needed to go through that really low breaking point. I really needed to do, to do it too. After that, to be able to look in the mirror and say, you know what, I've made this decision, this decision, this decision, and I've suffered these consequences, and, but on the positive side, I've done this, 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 and this. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty fucking awesome. It is. You know, so, sorry, pardon my French. But for as, as many of the highs and lows, it, it's part of life. That's life in a nutshell. That's a call of Barbara Walters on you, because I'm really trying to make you cry. You are trying like, to make me cry. I am not. I, am not. I, I still get sensitive about it. You know, make a good trailer, but I'm not trying to make you cry. The uh, One of the personal things you were going through is, is you were engaged to Kenny Dykstra at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, this was not when, um, God, we broke, we, we broke up well broke up before, before that. that. Well before that. Um, How much of an effect did that have on you, though, at, around that point? Were you past that? I was past that. I was well past that. Um, that was, we broke up, we broke up, well, we broke up several times, but um, I want to say that it was 2008, okay, 2009. So it, was, so it just probably wasn't. No, it wasn't uh, even it, remotely fresh. It wasn't even remotely fresh. How hurtful was it when he brought it back up on, he brought it up in social media and kind of threw you under the bus yeah. years after the fact, after he's been out of wrestling and you're still in wrestling? Uh, you know, I found, um, how do I say this without, I found it very hurtful. I found it hurtful because he, he lied. You know what I mean? And I have, I have, I feel like in my own life, I have made it a conscious effort to not put my personal and private life out there. I've made it a, cause I've built my career and, and you know, I've, it's been known that, I, you know, I've, I've dated a few people and obviously like that's that aspect of it, but I've, I've made it a conscious effort to build my career on who I was in the ring, not to build my credibility or to build my, you know, to get over on who I was getting under, if that makes any sense. Okay. And and I know that's a bit like harsh to say it that way, but I was I have I have not gone I've gone out of I've not ever gone out of my way to n speak negatively of anyone, including Ken, who you know, if if the truth be told on the real reasons as to why we broke up and the real reasons as to why we didn't work out it's an ugly thing, you know, and it's just like, I'd, I would have preferred it to be like, we were just at different places and different times. But the fact of the matter is, is that I never once cheated on him ever, you know, and I know for a fact that as he was sitting at home and recovering or whatever, he had a girlfriend and he was driving my truck to go see her at that time. So it's like for him to come back and say all these ugly things about me when it was him that was Doing, like, and I don't want to badmouth him, and I'm not going to say any, any more than that, but at some point in your life, and we all have to do this, you have to look in the mirror and own up to the decisions that you made and what was truly your downfall and who is truly at fault for your demise. And I can look at, my, at myself in the mirror, and I know what decisions I've made and how they've affected me, and I know what was good and what was bad, but I know that 
they are all on me. I don't, I don't point the finger and I don't blame anybody else. Because at, that, at the end of the day, you make your own decisions and you, you choose what happens. Nobody else. You know? And it's not fair. It's not fair to you or to anybody else to blame anyone else. You know? So... It was, it was just ugly. It's spoken I just, like a strong country girl from Virginia. <laughs> it's just crap. It's crap to be to sit there and like try to throw other people underneath the bus, or to like blame someone else when and when in all actuality it's like, you know, are you just trying to build some notoriety and credibility based off the somebody else's the crap that somebody else is going through, or, you know, I just I don't get it. I don't get I don't get it. Well, as one door closes, and there's and there's many things else that I could say, but I'm just not going to because it's not that's not who I am. You know, <clears throat> you know, I'm not asking you to do anything, but it, it's tough because when you're on the road for them, I mean, I can only imagine the stories that you could wreck lives with. Oh, you know? absolutely. But you don't. But do you it. don't do it. Right. You know, and it's not even that you wreck lives with. Like, but there's funny stories. There's stuff that you see that there's whatever, but. I like to maintain the fact that at the end of the day, like, this in some kind of weird way is still your family. Mm -hmm. And I care about these people, you know, and and their well-being and, and everything else. And, and unless it's something that's going to potentially, like, hurt their lives or hurt their health, you know, you just, yeah, you just, to, you know, to each his own. Everybody makes their own decisions and everybody makes whatever, but, yeah. Seems impossible to have a successful relationship with another wrestler. It really does. It seems with with all the travel and, and you have to take care of yourself and your own brand all the time. Mm -hmm. It just seems like it's very difficult to to find a successful balance. It you know, and it's obviously like you know, it's it's never easy. And I, I think that it's weird because you go like oh you know it, it's it'll totally mess it up like don't date people within the business don't date within the business and at the same time when you're that's the only people that you're around like you're around each other you're on the road with one another you guys have the, a lot of the same interests and passions at least when it comes to and granted it doesn't always work sometimes it's extremely passionate but you know you guys are just button heads but regardless of whatever it's like it's hard, you know, it's like, I feel like it's the same way in the acting industry, you know, they're like, oh, don't date your fellow actors or actresses, but you find that when people are shooting a movie together, all of a sudden, like, they've been working on this movie for a year, and they've been shooting together for a year, and all of a sudden, then they're dating, right. you know, it's it's just, it's funny, it's funny how life works, but. And it seems like even more impossible to be successful with someone that has nothing to do with the business, if you're completely immersed. Well, yeah, you just kind of have, I think just in... I found a solution for you, though. What is it? You have a solution yep, for this crazy? Yep, a solution crazy... for your dating. Yep, I found a solution. Well, yeah. We'll run a contest. All wrestling fans get to date Mickey James, right? Uh, no. Because they, they're part Absolutely of wrestling? Absolutely no, not. No. Okay. Right. Can you imagine? All right, just a fleeting thought. Just a lot. Just an idea. So, one door closes, another one opens. It gives you an opportunity to go back to TNA. Talk about the decision process and even going back there. Because I know a lot of people that come off WWE TV almost feel like, uh... Am I going to piss off Vince if I go back to TNA, if my goal is to get back there? Does that go into your mind when you're... Yeah, of course. Of course. And it was, I was a bit jaded, too, because I was heartbroken. Mm -hmm. You know, um, at that point, I didn't even want to talk about wrestling. I, didn't, I couldn't watch it. I couldn't talk about it. I didn't even want to hear the word wrestling. Like, even my fam, like, my little niece, Desiree, who I have turned into a massive wrestling fan because her Aunt Mickey is a wrestler... You know, and she's watched me because I've missed the first, you know, three, four years of her life because I was living in Louisville and now she's 11 years old. And, you know, she's just a massive, massive wrestling fan. Future diva. She is a future diva. Um, but I'll only let her train with me. I'll teach her everything. Well, not everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's just I was I was so I wouldn't say bitter. I was just heartbroken. And I was very cold and shut and shut off about it all. And it wait. Um, and so, and so, um, it was originally, um, Kurt Angle who called me and said that, you know, we really want, we really want you to come to TNA. I've talked to Dixie. Dixie wanted me to call you and we want to talk, you know, and I'm like, Kurt, I'm, 
thank you for the call, but I, I don't even want to talk about it. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to talk about it yet. Like, I don't want to. He waited about a month or whatever, and he called me back, and he's like, uh, you know, seriously, like, we really want to get you in here. You're freaking awesome. You're great. You're one of the best female wrestlers out there. Dixie really wants you to be a part of the company. Just think about it. Think about, like, conversation or whatever. And I go, okay. I said, well, let me think about it. And then it wasn't until Dixie actually called me, and she's, you know, gave me the whole pitch, the spiel, and, and she knew that I was working on the music as well. And a lot of people, a lot of people don't know about Dixie is that she also represented Tanya Tucker for, like, 20 years um, and worked with her. So she knows the country music world as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and talking with her and kind of like really feeling like it was going to be something different and I was going to still be able to like, I was still going to be able to do the type of wrestling that I loved and it was going to be something fresh for me as a character, as a television character, and that they were going to, I felt like they were going to utilize me right in, in like a cool light. Um, I, I was like... All right, so I agreed to it. You know, I agreed to go in and, and kind of do something. Tabling what she could do for you from a music perspective, because I want to talk about that in and of itself. What What is it that you wanted to do at that point as a wrestler when you came to TNA? What What, what were some of the things that were attractive to you about being there? Um, I think because, you know, people don't know the whole story of, like, and a lot of fans' eyes, like, I felt like, because there was no explanation. I'd like It wasn't like, oh, I retired or I had, like, this thing. It was just, so a lot of people thought that, oh, she just walked away from wrestling. Oh, she quit. And she quit because she's trying to go after country music. So she picked re music over wrestling, in which none of that was the case, you know. And so, But I have, there's no way to sit there and explain that without coming off as like you're whining, mm -hmm. you know. So I just kind of accepted it and rolled with the punches and kind of laid dormant for a while until it was a way for me to kind of address it. And um that felt like this was a way, an opportunity for me to kind of just, A, knock off the dust and prove who I was in the ring. And to prove not just to myself, but to my fans that... Because you must have I'm, in your head, must as much as you've done, as much as you've accomplished, wrestling is a very, what have you done right now business. What have you done for me lately? I yeah. Mean, you must have had some thoughts like, man, can I still go at the top of my game? Even, right, even yeah. Even just being on the sideline for a couple of weeks. Yeah, even, you know, and it is that. You kind of second guess yourself. And especially being, you know, when you get let go, you're like, God, what what have I done? Or, like, what is it that I'm lacking? Why am I not good enough anymore kind of deal? You know, especially when there's no real explanation mm -hmm. except for we're going into a different direction, you know, and it was just like, you know, and, and it, it was it was a bit after that, and it was it was you know until I could sit there, and that's what it ultimately came down to was me looking at myself in the mirror, going, you know what, shit happens, and what's done is done, and you can't go back, and you can't you can't fix history, but what you can do is move forward and beat it, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and, and prove and prove yourself, and and prove to yourself and to the fans. Or not even to the fans, but just to the business itself, who you are. So first impressions working for TNA, how, how was it different? What, what impressed you? What, what disappointed you maybe? Talk about your mindset when you came back. Um, I was nervous. I was nervous walking into the locker room because it's one of those things. Like I felt like, well, for the most part, I know most of these people. And then there's people that I don't know at all, you know, but... I knew, I felt like I knew um, most of the people and I didn't want to walk in. Like you don't want to walk in with your tail tucked in between your legs because I felt like I am confident in who I am and my ability, but you don't want to walk in with your butt on your shoulders either. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of finding that balance and like to be kind of accepted into the locker room as well because I know that, you know, the perception of like, oh, it's Mickey James from WWE. Oh, great! Like she's coming in to take our, our spot. Like every other WWE guy that's come into there. Right. Yeah. And 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 I get that, especially coming from the people that have helped build that company. But I think that what a lot of people failed to realize is like, hey, I help. I helped when this company was nothing, when we were at Nashville Fairgrounds every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know if you remember before there ever was a knockouts division. I was here, you know. I was the only girl to do that clockwork out Orange House of Fun match for years. For years, nobody was able to touch it until Daphne did it. And that was what, 
right before she left there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I've, I'm like, I still made a little bit of history here, a little bit of history that nobody has touched really, you know? So, um, I think it was just, but people don't remember that because it was so long, you know, it was, they feel like it was a lifetime ago, even though it really, it really wasn't. When you work for TNA, do you feel like you're only really working for a company part-time, whereas WWE, you feel like it's 100% of your life? WWE is definitely 100% of your life. Um, the, the cool thing with TNA that I found for me, especially at that point, is it was it allowed me to reconnect with my family and to get some of that quality time that I kind of missed out on. And I didn't realize how much I missed out on until I actually had the chance to kind of really reconnect and rebuild those bonds. Because it's one thing when you're on the road full time and you get to go to one or two family functions or events. But in the last few years, I've been able to go to, to some birthday parties and be a part of the family reunion and go to the powwows and all those little things that I missed out on for years. And granted, I wouldn't change a moment of it because my, my life was pretty awesome, you know, but it was, it was, it's been nice to be able to do that and to rebuild those relationships and to actually get to know, let my nieces get to know me, you know? Um, so it allowed me to do that and it allowed me to produce, um, you know, pursue my music career at the same time. So it, you know, you go from, whereas for me, because I'm still pursuing, I'm doing two careers, I'm still on the road the same amount of time as I was with WWE. I feel like at least 200 days out of the year, but only, except for the last two years with TNA, like I don't really get used that much, but like they have 100 dates a year and the other, you know, 50, 100 dates I was spent in Nashville, whether it was recording the album or on the road or trying to push the music or doing radio tours or whatever, so... It did. It was that. It was a balance of like trying to juggle everything. Whereas before, I was burning the candle at both ends of the middle. Do you, Do you feel like you have the time to be a successful music act and a successful wrestler at the same time, or do you feel like you have to keep struggling at both, hoping one takes off? Well, I feel like my wrestling has taken off in well, enough aspect. I'm, Obviously, I'm not. I'm not satisfied with where I'm at right now. You know what I mean? Like I don't. That's not. I don't want my last ever match on TV to be, um, you know, in a match like with ODB for the championship where I couldn't even say goodbye to, because nobody knew, um, to any of my friends. And that's certainly not the level that I would like to um, say, okay, that's it, you know, as far as my television career goes. But I really, you know, I don't, it's kind of the ball is out of my control. You know what I mean? Like... All I can do is keep plugging away and persevering and do whatever I can. There probably isn't enough time, but sometimes you just got to make time. And I am going after both, you know, wholeheartedly. Yeah, you know, when I when I said that last question, it came out the wrong way. I know, and I was like, no, that's not what I meant. Yeah, take well, your foot out of your yeah, mouth. Yeah, let me take my foot I'm just out. Kidding. Let me ask it again, and, give, and you'll give me the answer I was looking for. So, do you ever feel like wrestling pays the bills? You've built up your name. You mm -hmm. can go. You know, we're talking about. You can go to Nashville, New Jersey, New York, and you can. You could take the money and keep going that way. You might end up back working for Vince. You might go back to Dixie. We can hope. <laughs> what, whatever happens, like right. I mean, wrestling's there for you. Do you feel like going back to wrestling in some way impedes your ability to become a successful music act just because of time? Um, obviously, it does take away from. It's not like I. I mean, it's not like I can just sit there and give up everything. I mean, I still have bills to pay, and I still have you know, day to day life. And obviously at this juncture, I'm still plugging away. I've started, I'm in the music side. I'm pretty much at least since, you know, since I released my first album in 2010, I've almost started back at the indie scene in the wrestling business, like from that square one of grassroots trying to make it, you know, and that's kind of where I'm at. And I'm slowly starting to build that credibility and that notoriety behind me in the music. And I feel like Hopefully, just as in wrestling, if I just keep plugging away and pushing forward, something magical is going to happen, you know? And I, that's how I feel like I've been able to get signed with the label and my fan base is continuing to grow and I was able to put out my second album and the music video and we're already talking about a third album and, you know, it may not be millions of numbers and, and millions of dollars, but 
if you just keep plugging away and keep pushing. A lot of people don't know this, but you poured a lot of your own money. You invested in yourself in your music career. My entire WWE savings, I have spent pretty much every dime in trying Ooh. to trying to put and putting that first album out and even putting this music videos are very expensive they to are shoot. like i don't think that yeah so i mean i have my retirement fund can't touch that till i'm 60 <laughs> right. but um but it shows how much you believe in yourself too yeah well i mean if i can't invest that's the thing is like if you're not if you're not willing to make that sacrifice to invest in yourself how do you expect anybody else to whether it's time if you don't believe in yourself then you can't expect anyone else to believe in you. It's kind of like when you started when we were talking about the struggle and the parents said, well, maybe you should be thinking about something else and you don't give yourself right. a second option. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you pour all your money into your new career because you believe in it, you don't give yourself a second option but to succeed. Right. Well, that's not exactly true. But, well, we hope know, anyway. We hope. It's prayers the mentality. And, prayers and fingers crossed and... I just want to go through because I know a lot of people will read me if I don't talk about some of the specifics of your TNA career. So I wanted to just maybe touch on a few things. Talk about some of the matches you had with Gail Kim that stood out for you. Um, I think it was cool to finally be able to work with Gail because prior to TNA, there was only one other match that we actually wrestled on TV. And again, that match was a hot mess um, on WWE TV. And that was one of the matches where I was telling you about, like, we, as we're, you know, we're going through the day or whatever, we originally had eight minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we get to Gorilla right before we're getting ready to go out, and we're cut to four. And we both just, because we had been looking forward to this match for so long, and we were super excited about it. The fans had felt that had been looking forward to it. They had, you know, it was one of those things of, like, Obviously, we shouldn't we shouldn't like cater to what everybody oh everybody's talking about it. But we were just as excited. I felt like it was, as the it was fans. a women's dream match. It was. It was. I felt, and we totally dropped the ball on it because we, at the you know pressure last minute time cut, we just kind of, and it wasn't until the very end that it just went to I don't know what happened. It was like oh what's mm -hmm. what's happening. So I felt like we were we were able to reconcile that in our matches with TNA and she's an incredible, you know, wrestler. And, um, so we were able to come up with some cool different types of matches. You know, I think that also that you don't really see and combine our two styles and characters enough to be able to do something fun and unique. And it was just, it was fun. Cause I love Gail. I love Gail to death. And it was, she's very serious and she's very serious about wrestling. And I, I am serious about wrestling, but I also joke a lot, mm -hmm. which can be, that's why I think Lisa and I get along so good is because we joke half the time, like they're just being absolutely ridiculous. It's just my way to kind of like get over the stress and get over the nerves of just, mm -hmm. just be stupid. And somebody, I don't know if you crossed paths much, much with her in WWE, but uh, uh, Tess Mocker is now one of the, you know, faces of the knockouts division, mm -hmm. many memories of working with her. Um, I recently had a chance to, like, she's grown a lot as a performer in the ring, even since I've been there. And I know that she had kind of, like, made it a focus to go train and really focus on her wrestling ability. Because um, when I first got there, she was still really kind of jumbly or whatever, but I have had a chance to work with her. I, I, she's hilarious. And she's funny, and she's, you know... She definitely wants to be a, you know, a great wrestler, which I have, I always commend. Like if you, if you have the heart and the desire to get in there and tr at least want to, and try to be as best as you can be, that's for me, that's all that matters, you know? So, yeah, we had a baby face, baby face match recently, which was funny because, you know, she stylistically, like I'm trying to keep it like to tell a great story, but keep it like not too crazy to where, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know how to say it. Like, so it's not too like complicated, but we can still tell a great story, but she can still do her fun booty shakes and, you know. Because a girl like that can at least get over initially because of her looks and. Oh, yeah. Know. But to stay in the wrestling business, well, you have to be able to back it up. And I think that's literally. <laughs> that's right. I didn't even say that. <laughs> um, well, I think that's the that's the common thing with any level, anywhere. Like, you can originally get over 
on your looks and be the hot girl and if you're just a valet and as you're growing as a performer but hopefully the key is to not put yourself out there until you get strong enough as a competitor to not put yourself out there in the wrestling side too much to where you overexpose yourself and then people automatically it takes twice as long to rebuild people's respect on that aspect because at the end of the day it's wrestling like sure it's entertainment and sure it's you know we're girls so perhaps the bar isn't set quite as high but for me it is like I, it is set that high I don't want to have oh the best girls match you've seen in a while no I want to have one of the best matches on the cards girls or guys and if that's a bad thing then that's a bad thing but I think that I don't think that you should expect any less if you could put your stamp on your time with TNA, what, what do you think should be one thing that people remember the most from what you did there? Um, Maybe it was a match or... A... Two things. Probably my my the coming in, the that whole angle coming in, and the cage match would probably be the best part of that with Lisa, uh, Victoria, Tara. Um, that, and then what I'd really like, but I felt like we only really began to scratch the surface, is my heel turn mm -hmm. towards the end. And, uh, you think you got a little heel in you? Is that what you think? I had so much fun. Yeah, yeah I've been a, I've been a good guy for so long. Like that's who I was, and I, which I feel like it's kind of easy for me because for, most days I am a good guy at mm -hmm. heart. Most days, so, um, but it's just fun. It was so much, and I'd been begging, begging them to let me turn heel, to let me be a bad guy, like, because I already knew in my head, like the type of character like how I want it to be like I'm just like just let me turn but it's so it's so hard when you are so like I don't know how I don't want to come off as like oh look at me but like when you already so solidified in the fan size as this baby face character the people automatically want to cheer you they don't really want to boo you in their and I'm sure in, in their mind they're like, well, we're not going to, it's going to be an uphill battle. We're never going to be able to turn these people against you. But that to me, that's, that's the, that's where you separate, you know, the men from the boys is like, if I can't, if I can't turn these people against me and make them hate me, which I don't know that they hated me, but they would still boo me even if, but they'd still want to see me. That's where, that's where legit, that's where the legit heat is. It's like, they want to see you so they can boo you out of the building. Mm -hmm. If they just can't stand you, then that's not real heat. You know what I mean? Like, if they will actually pay money to come see you just so they can boo you out of the building, then you're doing your job. You know what I mean? And so... And it must be stimulating as a performer to be able to play a different role than you're oh, comfortable God. playing. Yeah, and to do something fresh and something different that you haven't done or you haven't seen in a long time, you know? Just added this new layer to me, and I was so excited. It was so, I was having fun with it. So you were unable to agree to new terms with TNA. It seems to be uh, you're part of a wave of a people wave. <laughs> who are not able to come to terms. To with come to deal. an agreement, yeah. Uh, just maybe not so much specifically your your situation, because I mean it's all always about money. You, it's not enough money, not enough time off, whatever it is. Uh, what what do you think of this wave of people that have been a big part of TNA now that suddenly seem to be leaving one after another? Um. Obviously. <sighs> It's kind of sad in a sense, especially for certain people like the AJs who have helped build that count company from day one, you know, or, you know, Jeff Jarrett, who obviously is the founder of the company, you know, like, and to see that for me, I feel like, okay, yeah, perhaps it is a bit sad that I didn't get to resign, but the way I look at it is everything in life has happened for a reason and everything. I've not seen it at that moment, but it's been a blessing in disguise further down the road and it took maybe sometimes it took me a while to see it but all I can do is like just kind of go with it and roll with the punches and yeah it's sad we couldn't come to terms or whatever but I'm not going to sit here and cry over spilt milk that's for sure what do you think uh TNA or any other group has to do to be successful I mean WWE is the industry leader right what does TNA or anybody else have to do to have a place in pro wrestling where they can be financially feasible. I mean, it's not just some guy throwing money at it because it's a hobby. Right. Um, I think, in all honesty, to truly be successful, um, and and this, obviously, my opinion is worth exactly, you know, what you're paying well, for. Two cents or, more than mine. Go ahead. It's, um, 
they have to stop comparing themselves to WWE and just be their own entity without trying to think of like what WWE is doing on television, the style that they're going with, the characters they're developing. They are a global phenomenon and they will always be that global phenomenon no matter what you do. So all you can do is just be you and be different and try to provide something that's special and unique enough that it isn't even comparable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you try to compare yourself to them, you will always be number two. Whereas if you try to just be your own thing and just do what you do, then you, that's all, you know what I mean? Then you're not, then you're not even trying to compare yourself to them. Sure. So it's like, I feel like it's better to be looked at as number one in your own world than number two in the big world. Do you think Dixie Carter did everything she could to help you for in terms of your music career? Um, probably not, no. But I don't think that, because I didn't want to give up it was a catch-22. I'm like, no, I don't feel like that she did everything that she possibly could. And in fact, like, there was like little things like Mon she had Montgomery Gentry come in and, and then they shot a video and then they chose Velvet to be in the music video. And um, I actually got in a music video based on my label. It was the Bucky Coven and Shooter Jennings video. My label had me get involved in that. Like, there, like, but I feel like because I didn't, and I, and I don't blame, I'm not sitting there, like, oh. I thought Velvet did an amazing job in the video, I'm not sitting here, but I think that because I wasn't willing to give up complete control of my music, you know what I mean, because I was, our, I, I really wanted to have that balance of, yes, to be able to utilize the platform that I had to be able to promote my music in some, in some aspect, but I wanted to keep it separate enough to where it was still credible and could stand on its own. If that makes any sense. And I don't know what I'm doing, and I don't even know if I'm doing it right. But I was just—I'm just continuing to plug away. And maybe because I wasn't willing to, aside from my entrance music, give up the rights to or you know allow certain things, that it probably affected how much she was willing to help in a sense. Sure. But in, in some aspects... You've been blessed with your intellectual property rights. I mean, the fact that WWE used your real name instead of, you know, I another was really, name. I was really fortunate about that. Oh, God, that was awesome. I mean, you know, what you're talking about, which a lot of people may not understand, is, is Dixie probably would have given you much more help if you were willing to let her share in the profits of your music. Right. Give up those intellectual property rights, which as an artist is the one thing that you don't ever want to give up. Right, because you're not really making, let's face it, anybody in the music industry isn't making the money that they were making 10 years ago because people are illegally downloading music. They are just YouTubing it or, you know, they're, YouTube. Going, <laughs> they're going on, you know, Pandora or Spotify or any of these uh, cool outlets. But people don't sell full on albums hardly anymore unless you have a massive, massive fan base which you absolutely deserve, the Miley's and the Reba's and the Metallica's and the, you know, even Taylor Swift. Like, their fan base is so huge that they are going to do great, but most people are only downloading singles, like one song. Mm -hmm. So one song may sell awesome, but the rest of the album, people, do not, they don't even and hear you can't give up the rights to the one hit because you may not have a one that matches that. Right, right. And, but they were cool enough to like, they played my music video. They started right, right before I left, they started playing my music video before, um, before the shows. So that was cool. Um, and they still like, they still sold the albums at the merch tables and stuff like that. So they were very helpful in some aspects, but you know, I probably didn't utilize them as much as they didn't also push me. You know what I mean? So, so, again, you know, this goes back to the dilemma where it's talking about time. Let me let me just give you like one of those forced choices because I'm not going to let you give me an answer in the middle. So you could have five years of a successful WWE run in your next five years, or you could have five years of a successful music launch, really blown up. You know, maybe five, six album deeps, live touring, and you have to choose. That's messed up. You can't have both. It's an F, Mary kill type scenario. You have to choose. I have to choose. You have to choose. That would be the hardest decision in the world. Why can't I have both? I really can't choose. Because the question wouldn't be as entertaining. <laughs> I think 
And That's this isn't a slide up. on wrestling, but I think I would choose. The, I would because I tell you why. It's because I have achieved in wrestling, except for really, you know, being able to have that last WrestleMania moment or to be able to say, you know, to end my career the really the kind of way that I would envision and, and I've prayed for and that I've hoped for. Um, I've done a lot. And I've been very blessed and very fortunate, and I surely wouldn't be ashamed if that's the way my legacy kind of ended in, in, in the world of wrestling. But I've only just started to scratch the surface in music, and if there was a way to kind of... That would be like the hit in the rest, having that WrestleMania moment in the world of music. So, yeah, because, I mean, that's... yeah. It seems like no matter what, you know, when I meet particularly females... In wrestling, they're they're really the artists, and they're guys too. But they're artists, and it's always like they're never happy with what they've accomplished. They're never like, oh yeah, that was fine. I'm good. I can retire now and be happy with whatever. It's always they want to do something new, and exciting, and creative. Uh, and and for you, it's music. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you've had that music bug in you since the violin days of uh, when you were probably a teenager playing the violin. It was more orchestra music then. <laughs> Mozart. So, so, so we've gone from Mozart to country. Yeah, Southern rock. Okay, is, country, is country, is country, country a rock. bad term to? No, I don't think so because it is. There's like, especially with my first album, it was very um, traditional kind of mainstream country. Uh, with this, with this new album, we've tried to kind of hone more into who I am, not just the type of music that I want to sing, the type of music that I want to write. Because there's some songs that I, there's some songs that I wrote on the first album. There's some songs that I wrote on the second album, um, but we tried to give it more of that rock edge because I am more southern rock than just mainstream girl next door country. Like you know, who, like who's your biggest influence? Would you say? Oh gosh, I love Reba, mm -hmm. and I mean, I so love you call like Reba a, country. Southern? Reba's definitely country. So, okay, right. yeah. I was gonna say you're not saying she's southern rock. No, right? not at all. Okay. But I do love you know. I love Reba. I love you know Tim McGraw. I love all kinds of music. I love Metallica. I love Snoop Dogg. I I mean, I've listened and loved everything, you know. But if I had to listen to one style of music for the rest of my life, it would probably would be like Southern rock type of you know Leonard Skinner to Rolling Stones to the Eagles to Journey like that whole era, you know Stevie Nicks all of it. That's what I. That's so kind of like with your struggle when you were in a rising indie wrestler performer waiting for that first contract, you kind of do, you know, these shows, and it's nice because you have a, a wrestling fan base to at least start with. As, right. As a, when when people when you're tonight we're doing a we're doing a country music show a southern rock show with Mickey country James, southern country rock right How about here that? in Charlotte and I mean inevitably uh, probably a large base of that audience is going to be wrestling fans. Yeah. It's nice to have them, but we're trying to create the the fans of the music. Absolutely. Well, and it's it's awesome to have because I feel like for for the most part my fan base or my fans James Gang whatever you want to call them. They're very, they've been supportive day one of anything and everything that I do. So, um, and I'm grateful for that because they're going to support me no matter what. And obviously it's really great to have that, that loyalty, that fan base or whatever in order to try to help launch and, and build a, a fan base in the music side. But let's face it, like not all wrestling fans are country music fans, you know, or even fans of the type of music, whatever you want to call it, that I sing. But for some of them who either, A, like what, what I found is like, even though you put it out on there on your social media stuff or whatever, people don't really pay attention. They mm -hmm. don't. So there'll be times when people, even still right now, after, I mean, I've been tweeting about it and, and put it on social media for what, four, now, four years now? They have no idea that I even have one album out, much less two. You know, so it's like, Really? Like, okay. But, um, so you're still kind of building that awareness and hopefully like if they get to, what I think the cool thing is like when they come to the show live, it's way different than just hearing the record or, you know, hearing it on the radio or however you've, you've actually heard maybe once, at least one song, because then you, you are a part of the show and it's still that, like I said, that grassroots style where we we've performed in front of, you know, like. I don't know, three, four thousand people, 
and we performed in front of a hundred, you know, so it's still like, the, it's like the indie scene all over mm -hmm. again, like just kind of. And you know, it's like, uh, you know, coming to, this is the first time I'm going to get to see you in a live concert. But, oh, I hope I don't and blow I'm not, it. And I'll tell I hope you, I don't blow it. My wife is a fan of country, but I am not a fan of country music at all. If anything, I'd say I'm not. The one air, the one type of music I don't like is country, but I'm interested you? to see <laughs> Mickey kidding. James, the performer. Oh, good! You know? I'm just, excited. Just kind of see seeing Mickey James like how she performs because I, yeah. I think that's a big part of uh, the live act when people go to see musicians. And I'll tell you, like I'm a bit nervous about this show because it's really like the first time that I've done shows after wrestling events, but in separate buildings or in like we've done a show in Atlanta where I was wrestling that night. And then we had a show at the Hard Rock later that night. And so maybe a couple of the wrestlers would come over, a couple of the people from the locker room. But like to do this, I find that even more nervous or like have, have more anxiety about it because it's your peers, the people that already respect you in one arena and now are coming to hear you for the first time in another arena with either already a preconceived like conception, like perception of what they think it's going to sound like or perhaps they're coming in open-minded you don't know right mm -hmm. but they're whatever you do that night that's what they're going to walk away with you know so i'm nervous i hope i don't blow it you won't blow it. i won't blow it so you just went back it's been a couple of years you went back and you worked for the wwe and uh talked well, some of their young <laughs> talent down in florida and got to see the performance center and, and you uh did also you also did an interview with WWE.com. I did. You know, it's it's usually you usually don't get to do those things unless they consider you in their good graces. Well, yeah, so I'm grateful for that. So hopefully I am in their good graces. So should the opportunity present itself and appear back on WWE TV, um, how much does your desire to be a successful musician weigh in on that? Whether I go back or not, mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't hen Like I don't think. What do you mean weigh in? I don't think it weighs well, in. Well, I mean, because if you, what we talked about is WWE is now a full time job. Yes. Goes back to time. Yes. It's all about sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I've obviously, if I had the chance to be able to go back, of course. I mean, I loved my time there, and I would love a, an opportunity to kind of. Um, mm -hmm redesign my career ending there if that makes any sense and obviously a, a, a dream match scenario for a lot of fans would seem to be you versus aj aj came in kind of with the same program that you started with kind of being the stalker and stuff and, and she is now mm. kind of did she write it i probably if <laughs> she did joking. she probably didn't give eight, 18 weeks of tv <laughs> i'm joking i, I don't know no, there has been a ton and to be honest, like I've caught, obviously I've tried to catch up and, mm -hmm. and play catch up with a lot of the television um, since I've left TNA. But even when I was with them and then with, I really didn't have as much time to kind of stay on what was happening. And I, I did notice and it was constantly getting um, reminded of these comparisons between her and I, but I really didn't get to see it. Um, and I felt like it was different enough to where it's its own. Mm -hmm. um, so which is which is a good thing um but yeah it seems to be that would be that's what the fans want to really i think that's what the fans want you think so mm -hmm. i think you're see... telling the wrong person mm. no you know things travel <laughs> no uh people that would be put awesome. these things up on youtube illegally and people watch them you know, <laughs> and uh you know i think another dream match scenario would be for uh, you and natalia which is two yeah. of the most respected in-ring performers oh thank you and uh and seeing what you guys could do and I think the, you did get to, did you? I got to, to work, work with, with Natalia maybe three or four times, you know, in the ring as far as that goes. Um, but never really fully one-on-one -on -one or like a legit program. Just and she's she and probably I. more in her prime now and you're in your prime. So it Right. Would, it would be, it would be awesome to be able to come back and do something special there. And obviously I would love the, I'd love the opportunity to be able to work with all the girls there, you know, and, and really do something special, hopefully with them all. But, um. You know, a dream H scenario for you is you go back to WWE, you're on Total Divas, and they integrate your country music, I'm sorry, Southern Rock, into the Total Divas show. That would be a dream for me? Don't you think? It that would be exposure? pretty awesome. No, that kind of exposure, you couldn't, yeah, you, you couldn't ask for better exposure than that. That would be really cool. Just put that in your uh, rider when you know, when you're resigning. And, and blue M&Ms. 
Blue M&M's? Peanut. Blue peanut M&M's. Because I want my protein with my chocolate and my candy shell. Right. Yes. What impressed you most about the Performance Center? Oh, my gosh. Um, That place is immaculate. Like, the fact that they have, like, they have all these tools. Like, you would, as, as a wrestler trying to break into the business, you would pray for half of this stuff to be at your fingertips. Like, you, we would cut promos in front of the mirror or in front of the handheld camera, you know, the shaky camera with the VHS. Like, I'm really dating myself, aren't I? No. <laughs> no, but that's how it was. And, like, I mean, the technology, they pretty much have a live television, everything that you need to mold yourself into being a superstar right there at your fingertips. The only criticism I'll give it, and it's a very, very minor one, is that they're in kind of a shell. Mm, a bubble. A bubble. And their only ability to do live performances are usually the TV stuff. Or You don't get that live feel. How much do you think that is essential to, to being a well-rounded performer? Um, Hitting, you know, like you got to hit the indie scene before you got that training. And I really think that that helped me. I know. And then, and especially, um, you know, on the female side, I've noticed like it, it, there's only, like there's more girls that have never wrestled before learning how to wrestle there than there are, like there's some actual like legit workers that have, are super talented, like. There was some girls there that I was I was mega impressed with, um, and even you know one or two of them that actually had just started wrestling mm-hmm. there, you know. So it just goes to show you really never know. Um, but for me, the way that I got better and the way that really helped mold me as a as a athlete and as a performer and what I really learned from was always working with people that were better than me. I never really learned from working with people on the same level or worse than me if anything like you know you start to digress or you become um complacent in the sense of like you really just kind of start to plateau out um and so when i went in to like work with them or whatever it wasn't a lot of like really hands-on stuff that i could do with them and it's just um you ever heard of the the expression the blind leading the blind Mm -hmm. like if you are not like if, for me, if I was to go in, if I was to be a full-time trainer, I would be a, I'd want to be a very hands-on trainer because that's how I got better, that my trainers, you know, obviously beat the crap out of me, but it was a different time then, you know, like, and I got, and I worked with the guys and they beat the crap out of me and everybody was better than me and that's how I got better. Um, so I hope that as, as it grows and as the girls get better, they get to continually start to, you know, work with people who are better than them. So do you think they can play catch up what they lose on the live experience by just being around people that are better than them? Yeah, well, I mean, because they could, if, hopefully if they truly, you know, you truly want it, you'll absorb all the knowledge that you can. Like, I would pull people, you know, I would pull Ricky Morton aside because God knows how many indies that I worked with him in Virginia that he would be on the show and I'd ask him to watch my match. Anybody that had been anywhere that would ma- had made a little bit of money in their life or had, like, a career or had any type of respect as far as in the ring, like, if they had five minutes... I would ask them to please watch my match and tell me what I'm doing right, tell me what I'm doing wrong, more importantly, so I could learn from that. And, you know, that that's that kind of wanting it, and hopefully they're, they're, they're already ingrained to be very respectful there. Like, they were super respectful, they were super receptive, and and hungry to, to learn knowledge, at least, you know, for the most part. So um, I do see, I did see some, like, what I, who I thought were going to be the next stars, you know, as far as on the girls' side. Anyway, I didn't, I only got to really work with the girls, so that's the only thing that I could really. A lot of people saying that the uh, the division they have in NXT right now is almost as strong, obviously much younger than what they have right now on their TV product. It's yeah. a lot of talent in the pool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, there's some really great girls there. There's Paige, there's Emma, and um, there's Bailey. Those three were like probably like at the highest. Um, there's that, what's her name, Mercedes. Mm-hmm. She trained with Lance Storm, I think. Um, I'm trying to think of what her, I just knew her as Mercedes. And it, she was she was really impressive. And then there was this little girl, her name was Alexis. Maybe I was partial. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, she she super impressed me, and I don't think that she, I'm not sure that she was a wrestler prior to coming there, but she was extremely athletic, and she had this unique kind of look that was that I don't know. Yeah, some people just got it. Right. You can't put your finger on it. You can't explain it. It's just it. I know you're all about the fans, so I want to wrap up this with a couple of questions that we got from some fans, things that may not have fit into uh, what we discussed yet. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the first questions I got is, do you think TNA is going to even exist a year from now? I sure hope so. I really do hope so for the sake of the business and for the sake of... <clears throat> it's already hard enough, you know, being in a professional sport and knowing that it's not like the NFL, it's not like the NBA or, you know, baseball or anything. Whereas when you become a professional athlete, you got at least 20 different teams to play for. There's two places you can really go. You know, if you go to Japan, three, or Mexico, four, you know, but even still, there's two, two big games in town, and one's obviously way bigger than the other. If that second one goes away, that gives all the power and all the control and everything a lot of people lose their jobs. A lot of people lose their jobs. And the people that do have jobs, it also, because it's it, that's business, you know what I mean? If there's mm -hmm. no competition, then you kind of like, it. it this, is, this is the big dance. This is where you want to be. This is what you take. This is, this is it kind of deal. What's the biggest change you've seen um, in female wrestling since you started the business to, to what it is today? Um, I've seen it go on the whole roller coaster to where the females did they didn't want them to really it was more tna it was more it wasn't like in the forefront as far as wrestling wasn't as important to we want our you know to wrestling being very important and the women to be seen in the same light as any of the men as far as athletes and you know credibility to it's not important as important anymore to it's important like it's constant back and forth isn't it like we go through that whole sex sells to we want it back to the wrestling to we want the glamorous side and you you know you're beautiful women to but you're still athletes it's 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 ever changing just and, the business and, is ever and now changing now it seems you have to do both you have to be everything <laughs> yeah. um and if you don't come up with this answer I'm going to lead you into it oh what is the craziest thing you've seen or heard about yourself on the internet the craziest thing I've seen or, or heard, heard about yourself on the internet. That's the question. God, I don't. I try not to read the internet Do on you. purpose because it's filled with negativity. I'm gonna say it like that. <laughs> no, I do try to st try to avoid it because I feel like. I'll, obviously, like some of the stuff is laden with a little bit, or they've heard some type of truth along the way, but most of it is just opinions based on what they think that they might have heard or some skewed version of some I don't know story or something so I've heard seen and heard some pretty crazy stuff all right well you didn't go there so I'm gonna bring it up there's a certain video out of there it says Mickey James sex video that is oh not God. even you it's not me that it's that a lot of people just because it says Mickey James I don't know, and I tried to, and I will swear to God on my mother's life, and I'd put my hand on the Bible if you had it. It's not me, and I have, I have completely owned up to a lot of things, and and you know, done and not done, made some of the smartest decisions, but that is not me. And if you were to look at that girl, you can tell that it's not me. And that's not the only one. There was another one prior that with this girl that had shorter hair and she had tattoos, and obviously, if you look. She and I don't even have the same body. I've never had tattoos where that girl had tattoos, and it's just like. But you can't do anything about it. I've I've tried to right? fight it, or what, you get different... one taken yeah. down, and then four more pop up. But right. it's like, I don't know if somebody decided like, okay, I'll tag her name onto these, and and in some way it will draw more traction and more views, which obviously it's worked. But well, not just you. I mean, I would say you could put that on every famous. Female wrestler, if you look actress. up Britney Spears, yeah, every, new everybody's, video, got, a video everybody's got apparently this video out there, but it's not me. It's I swear to you on my mom's life, that is not me. I've never even dated a black guy. I've never, I mean, not that I w I'm just, <laughs> I, there's no way to swing that one to even sound whatever. <laughs> I know, but I know these things get frustrating. It's very me. frustrating yeah. because it, it's hurtful because it's like, I feel like 
what you know it's, not fair, it's damaging because obviously it's hurt me in getting label deals it's hurt me in getting it's really? hurt my yeah it's hurt me in, in other aspects where people because they're when they see that it's like oh, oh all of a sudden like a meeting's canceled or whatever right because they think that they don't know any better they they believe because it's out there that apparently it is when in reality it's not where it, and it's like if something is true or whatever i go well yeah you know what mm -hmm. it is what it is you know so but it's frustrating it's very frustrating let's flip it what's the favorite let's talk about something positive best fan interaction you've ever had the be best a, you know, a story or oh you know what always would get me is like when um there would be little girls and they would dress and when i used to wear the skirts and like the bop around like when i first came in I would constantly get, and I still get it now and then, and I still, I got it with the hardcore country with the t-shirts and the, they would dress up as me when they would come to the, some of the signings mm -hmm. and they would do my whole entrance or they'd sing my song. And those are the best because at the end, like, I remember being that little girl, this avid, like wrestling fan, like, Oh, I love wrestling. I'd elbow my dad. Um, so that's the really cool side of it. Cause those you see, like, you know, you know, that at least one or two of those girls further down the road you're going to see them and they're going to be the next star mm -hmm. you know so anybody that you never got a chance to work that you were, would like to wrestle um wow um i would have loved the opportunity to work with um obviously sensational sherry like she's who i really like looked up to um molly holly I would have loved to work with her. With I never oh. really worked with Molly. No, I worked out with her in the ring, mm -hmm. like practice wise, but never like anything within that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of who else. I never really worked with Jacqueline that much. You know, um, I've been really fortunate to work with a lot of the girls that I have, and I think that that's it's hard to go back and say like, oh, there's so many people that I wanted to. Um, if there's one other person that I can say that I truly wish that we had had a chance to do something really special on TV, it would be Serena. And that's just because she has, I mean, such a special place in my heart. And I'm, I'm particularly biased, I think, because I think she's incredible. And I remember when she first came into wrestling, when she first started training at OBW, and I was still there. And I just kind of... I just, I, you know, you see so much of yourself sometimes in people or that same passion and that same love that you can't help but just automatically be on their team, you mm -hmm. know? All right. I'm going to come down to one final question. I'm choosing between three or four here that I'm going to pass up on. All right. This one it seems like it'd be a philosophical question. Oh, philosophical. If Mickey James could sit today, could sit down with the Mickey who was about to start her career. What advice would you give her? Oh, God. I guess I would say to, um, you know, there's going to be more lows than there are highs, and, and but all those, like the moment of making it will make it all worthwhile, and to never doubt yourself, and to believe, always believe in yourself, and to continue to fight and um the one thing that i would probably hopefully um ingrain in her which you know obviously like i can't it's hard to say this because all these moments like throughout the tenure of my career is all molded me as a performer and as a as a person you know but if there's one thing that i could i could like hopefully bestow on her it's like to not let other people's opinions of you and expectations of you affect your own expectations of yourself and your opinions of yourself. To not let them, you know, construe or, or like even, because that's the hardest thing, you know, is, is to maintain that belief in yourself and, and to believe that you're still good enough when sometimes not everybody thinks you are. So, yeah. I think that's a great way to close. And you think so? I appreciate after years and years and years, Aww. you've finally given us this full access to your career and uh, and being. Well, thank you. I know your fans. You know, there are a few people that I that I genuinely would say have a 
core set of fans that I mean they just they just go crazy over them and, and you are one of those select people oh you know like I know there's a, there's, a, there's a crowd out there that there's at Mickey least James five fans. people no that no it's love larger me than that death. I mean I don't understand it no, I'm just <laughs> but but you definitely have a following and it's because you've always been great with the fans and uh, you've well, always treated fans with respect and you've always been honest with them and uh, we appreciate the time of course that you gave today. I, well you know what it's one of those things of like. I, you know, I do recognize the fact that I wouldn't be able to live the dream that I love and do what I do on a daily basis if it wasn't for them. So try to be giving and loving, but I'm grateful for sure. And I'm grateful for you. Awesome, Mickey. Thank you thank again you. so much.